Ladies and gentlemen, we'll call the meeting of the Del Mar Board of Regents to order at 1 p.m. on Tuesday, October 5th. Uh, I'm going to do a roll call to establish quorum. Dr. Adami? Here. Ms. Averett? Here. Mr. Bennett? Here. Mr. Garza? Here. Ms. Hutchison? Here. Dr. Kelly? Here. Dr. Kelly? Yeah. Mr. Kelly? Dr. Turner? Here. <laughs> Dr. Villarreal? Here. I'm Carol Scott. We have a quorum and can conduct business. Just trying to give you a... Uh, well, I, I, there. I do have a Juris Doctorate. There we go. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> that works, that works. Uh, would you all please join me in a moment of silence? Thank you very much. Dr. Turner, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? Thank you all very much. And as is our custom, would you please join me in reading the Del Mar College vision statement. Del Mar College will be the premier choice for life-changing educational opportunities provided by responsive, innovative faculty and staff who empower students to improve local and global communities. Thank you. Del Mar College is streaming live audio and video from our official Board of Regents meeting on the college's website in real time, with the exception of portions of the meeting as may be considered closed session by statute. We, uh, as is our custom, begin with recognitions uh, to uh, recognize students and faculty, and this time we're going to start with recognizing a regent. Uh, Dr. Lori Turner has been selected uh, as Texas Hist History Teacher of the Year by the Coastal Bend uh, Daughters of the American Revolution, and we wanted to congratulate Dr. Turner for that recognition. Thank you very much. As a new member of the Daughters of the American Revolution, <laughs> I went through all the history and all of the uh, documentation to do that, so when, when uh, Lori shared that with me, I said, well, we need to make that recognition at our board table as well. Thank you. Thank you. I'm now going to turn it over to Dr. Halcom to recognize uh, one of our outstanding faculty members. Madam Chair and esteemed regents, John Hornsby, Police Academy Director and Instructor of Law Enforcement, served on the Texas Commission on Law Enforcement Legislative Update Curriculum Committee for the 87th legislative session. The team of dedicated professionals on the committee included active state and local peace officers, a regional law enforcement trainer, retired police chief, and attorney from the Texas District and County Attorneys Association, and TCOL members. Mr. Hornsby contributed his knowledge and expertise to collaborate with the committee and write a summary of selected court cases and changes to Texas criminal laws that were enacted by the 87th legislative session. The 45-page summary is the curriculum course guide for law enforcement instructors to use statewide in developing their lesson plans to teach the legislative update course. The legislative update course is required for all Texas peace officers and necessary for them to stay versed on current laws. Um, I'd like Mr. Hornsby to come forward, please, so we can congratulate him. So I'd like to have you join me. And would you like to say a word or two? Uh, <laughs> well, I didn't really have anything prepared, but it wasn't all my doing. There were seven members on the committee statewide, uh, and I could not have done it without the support of uh, not only the staff that works at the, at the uh, academy, but also the public service uh, section of our uh, division of the college. So thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Hornsby. On behalf of the Board of Regents, we appreciate your taking on additional workload, especially one that has statewide significance. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Next, we will hear from Ms. Patricia Benavides Dominguez with a couple of recognitions. Hello. Uh, 
This afternoon, I'd like to recognize uh, Lisa Leal Garcia. She's here today. Uh, she is the coordinator of student engagement and retention and received the 2020-21 Circle of Pride Award for going above and beyond her job duties. During the fall and spring registration period, Lisa volunteered to be cross-trained with the retention services and began taking overflow appointments, volunteered uh, to field inquiry emails, and manage the Viking Food Pantry, helping to successfully distribute over 11,000 pounds of food for students in need. Her usual job duties are addressing student conduct issues and faculty consultations. Lisa, would you like to say a few words? Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'd like to thank the exempt council for recognizing me, uh, the foundation office for the generous gift as a prize, and uh, to also thank uh, the associate vice president, Cheryl Sanders, and my dean, Rita Hernandez, for allowing me to explore new job duties for uh, learning new and for fostering that atmosphere in our division that allows us to explore and to better serve students. So thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Congratulations, and, and uh, indeed it is uh, uh, auspicious recognition to be a Circle of Pride award winner, and thank you for your extra effort. Next, the, the other uh, faculty staff member that I'd like to recognize is Leticia Wilson, Director of uh, Advising Initiatives. She has been appointed to the NACADA, which NACADA stands for the National Academic Advising Association Administrators Institute Advisory Board. The term is a two-year commitment. The advisory board will advise the NACADA Executive Office on strategies and activities for providing services to the members and organizational operations related to the Administrators Institute and Advising Seminar. Leticia is here with us today. If she would like to say a few words, we'd like to recognize her. Good afternoon. Hello. To the Board of Regents, to my president, and to all that are here sitting here today, I would like to say thank you for the recognition for being recognized by our Global Academic Advising Network, NACADA. I am very excited because on the board of NACADA, there's not a lot of two-year representation. And I wanted to bring this example of these Band-Aids. Last year was the year of the reckoning, I would say, where we talked about diversity and inclusion. And I'm very happy that we're gonna have that committee coming soon by our president. And so sitting on this board will allow me to have the student's voice, will allow the two-year community college voice, but also a woman of color, a woman that has been in higher ed for now 15 years, but most importantly, representing our victorious Vikings at the global level. So I'm excited. I'm really excited about what we're doing with Guided Pathways with Dr. Wilson with our QEP, Goals Plus Planning Equals Success, and what we're doing with Project Cinda, and I'm so grateful to be a part of this community of Del Mar College. So thank you for the recognition, and I couldn't do it without the people that I get to work with every day. That means the primary role advisors, the enrollment specialists, the dual credit coordinators, and our faculty advisors. I can't do the work without my colleagues. So I appreciate being recognized today, and I appreciate what you do each and every day for our community and our constituents. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Wilson, your energy and uh, your articulate nature uh, are exactly what we need in our advising program. Uh, congratulations, and, and continue to bring that energy. I know that you do in every, in every encounter that you have. Congratulations. Next item on the agenda is the opportunity for general public comment. Is there anyone here to provide general comment to the board on an item not on our agenda today? Seeing none, we will move on to our uh, student success report and bring Ms. Patricia Benavides Dominguez back.
Okay. Uh, the success point that I would like to uh, discuss with uh, today is um, the highlighting the Student Government Association at Del Mar. And we have a few uh, members here that I'll, that I'll introduce here shortly. But I wanted to, uh, okay, hold on, let me move this slide, sorry. Uh, I wanted to begin by uh, recognizing uh, some of its members, but first I wanted to talk a little bit about the award. Uh, the SGA has been nominated for the National Crime Victim Service Award. And uh, this award is in 2022. This prestigious award is coordinated annually by the Office of Victims of Crime, a component of the Office of Justice Program, U.S. Department of Justice. This prestigious award honors, uh, award honors extraordinary individuals and programs that provide services to, crime, to victims of crime. The award recognizes and programs and individuals whose work has been particularly noteworthy and that exemplify the long-term commitment that characterizes many victim service providers, some of whom are also victims themselves. Um, so our SGA officers this year are Sofia Jimenez, president. Is she here? Y'all can come up. Sofia Jimenez, president. Caitlin Gosselin, vice president. Vice president. Samantha Luna, secretary. Lonnie Gomez, Magistrate, Eliza Long, Treasurer, Adam Bernal, Parliamentarian, and Melinda, uh, Melody uh, Kloss, Communications and Historian. The other two additional members of uh, this team is uh, Will Greeley, he's the DA with the Justice Center, uh, and Angela Luna, she's the Victims' Rights Coordinator. So I, without further ado, I do want to uh, also play this little clip. And this was on a recent news story on Channel 3. Good afternoon. Hello. Um, to the Board of Regents, Dr. Scamilla, thank you for acknowledging SGA. I might get emotional. 
because this project was definitely a labor of love for us. You know, we, I tell the students all the time, the community gives so much to Del Mar College, and we have to give back to the community. And today we have Sophia Jimenez, who is our SGA president. We also have Angela Luna, who is victim's right coordinator from the Juvenile Justice Center. And I just call him Will, Mr. DA, from, <laughs> from the Juvenile Justice Center. And we decided to do this in um, fall of 2020, no, fall of 19, when Angela Luna came to me and said, we need a safe space for our victims under age of 18. And so I went over and visited with her and I walked and I saw this closet and I was like, oh, what can we do with that? But look at the amazing outcome of what we did. And COVID hit and we had to stop. And, but once they told us that the court was gonna open back up in June of 21, we knew we had to get on it and complete the project and we did. So I'm so happy to have Sophia Jimenez as the president of SGA and for the Juvenile Justice Center to be here today. And thank you. Hi, I'm Sophia Jimenez. I first wanted to say it's been an honor to represent the students again this semester. So I do appreciate that honor very much. And it was, like Ms. Cage, a labor of love. And um, it meant a lot for us to complete this project and give back to our community. And it was just in time to celebrate the 40th anniversary of Crime Victims Week. So that meant a lot to us. Uh, unfortunately, due to COVID, like Ms. Kate just said, we had to push things back. So to be able to complete this project meant so much to us. And it's just an honor to be nominated. And we truly appreciate that. And uh, as a student, I just want to thank you all, uh, Board of Regents and also Del Mar College for all it's given to me as a student, for my education. It means so much to me. And I've had such wonderful advisors and educators. And I am just blessed to have had that in my life. So thank you so much. Congratulations to all of you. So my name is Will Greenley. I'm one of the prosecutors with the New Aces County DA's office. And I just, I cannot say how wonderful this new room is. I, I cannot say how just impactful it is on these young people um, to not have to just go sit in the lobby when they're talking about as, something as serious as surviving a sexual assault. Um, My name's Angela Luna, I'm the VAC over at Juvenile. Um, it's a simple mandate in the Code of Criminal Procedure and also in the Family Code that says they need a place separate and safe from their offender, from their offender families. That's the biggest thing is when the families start. Um, I'm a probation officer also, so I have to be trained in uh, how to control a situation with an offender but most of my skills are used within the families and trying to keep families apart in lobbies. And it gets so terrible for the victim. So when I expressed this to Beverly, and we did it over tears, <laughs> um, she says, we could do it, we'll do it. And I, I had my doubts because it was a very small closet and it was horrible, but I spent three days in that closet <laughs> with three victims prior and a tattoo removal machine. That's what was in that closet. And so, uh, so when it became this, it's, it's amazing. And we do use it even in our interviewing. We have a place to separate them for interviews and stuff. And it's been, it's been amazing and we thank you. And it's the first here, not any other court in town has one of these, even though it's mandated. But uh, thank you, thank you Delmar, thank you. Hear, hearing those stories, I know has touched each of us at the day as today. Thank you, um, Patricia, for bringing this to us. Thank you, Beverly. Uh, thank you, Sophia. And thank you for telling us the impact. It's very important for us to really understand uh, that impact, and, and you have delivered that message today. Congratulations. Great, great work. Ah. <sighs> Now we'll move on to our college president's report, Dr. Escamilla. Thank you, Madam Chair. Regents, everyone here today, um, coming off that report is kinda, kinda brings it all home, doesn't it? Uh, reminds me of my criminal justice days before I went into education. Um, 
Just powerful stuff going on. So I'd like to talk to you first about the return to campus um, as we put our highest priorities with health and safety uh, at the forefront. Uh, in many ways, it's status quo in terms of operations, uh, but we continue to, to advance on, on our positioning and, and regaining our campus uh, in a physical way uh, by our physical presence. Uh, that being said, uh, we are coming off the, um, the rise in cases of the Delta vir uh, variant, virus variant, um, which, um, as you all, as it was to everyone in the world, and, and Corpus Christi is not an exception, uh, was a big surprise uh, to the, at the, in terms of the power of, of, of its uh, onset here and, 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 uh, and the increasing uh, infection rate. The college is maintaining social distancing guidelines, strong, strongly recommend, recommends wearing facial coverings and getting vaccinated, again, to help sp uh, spread COVID. And I have some more details about a vaccination program that we have in just a little bit. I don't want to steal that thunder um, because it's, we'll have the appropriate details here in just a little bit. Um, but the campus-wide uh, COVID-19 um, positive cases um, have uh, declined significantly in past weeks from August uh, 30th to October 3rd, um, the reported total positive cases dropped by about 88% from 43 to five cases, just like that. And so 45 was a, was a, we felt was a pretty, relatively speaking, okay? Not one case is okay, but 45 was a number that we felt was being uh, in, in response to our, to our efforts. And then for it to go down to five, we felt, okay, then it, there's some natural things going on here, literally some natural things with the declining cases. But the college will remain uh, in return to campus phase through, three through the fall semester because we're, we're, we're going into flu season and we're being cautioned um, to be careful um, with the change in, in, in literally in the weather and, and, and the like in the, in, in the environment uh, for the virus. Um, there are other variants out there and other things, and <clears throat> we've learned not to guess but to calculate through as conservative yet as forward-thinking um, methods as possible to, to get through this virus. It's a day at a time. It's a, it's a week at a time, but we do keep our eye on the horizon for sure um, here at the college. <clears throat> and again, we're gonna have some other um, messages and other presentations here in just a little bit to talk a little bit about um, how we're proceeding. Um, I'm very proud to see the college, uh, again, it's, it, you know, in, in some ways this fall was worse than last fall uh, at the beginning at this time, but, uh, but at, the, at the same time we have, it's, it's nice to see students uh, on campus doing what, what they need to do and with our faculty and staff members uh, supporting them and, and just the ways that we've presented here. Um, you know, we've got an, an indomitable spirit here at Delmore College and it's being shown um, throughout the COVID pro um, pandemic. Um, next, um, I'm going to move on to a uh, four-year review. Um, as is typical this time of the year, we have the 2020-2021 statistical profile um, for you all uh, to review. It, it will also be on the website if, it is, if it's not already, um, but that is there for your review. If there's any data point in there that you have a question over, uh, please call me. And uh, it's only written in paper. It's, there's nothing carved in stone, so please... Uh, take your time to take a little time to look it over in and, and all your leisurely reading time and, and call me if you have any questions for sure. Uh, one other item that I is a, a requirement is the I, I as the chief executive officer of Delmar College am required under state law to um, to let you all know that under Texas Education Code 51.235C we uh, are responsible for um, presenting to the board uh, that the information um, received, but let me see, hang on, let me get it here. There's a part I had to read. Under Texas Education Code, TEC, section 51.253C, the institution's chief executive officer is required to submit a report at least once during each fall and, or spring semester to the institution's governing body and, the, and, and post on the institution's internet website a report concerning the reports received by employees under the TEC section 512252 concerning sexual harassment, sexual assault, dating violence, or stalking as defined in, t in the TEC section 51251, and any disciplinary action taken under TEC 
you see section 51255. That's the, uh, the essence of it. This is uh, included in your report. There are links on the web. Everything has been uh, fully uh, complied with and complied by the college regarding um, this state uh, requirement. Finally, I have one other, one other item uh, because there's many other questions. It, it, it's, a, it's a housekeeping item and I want, while we're all here, just to kind of talk a little bit about the setup that we're having. Just, gonna look, just a little commercial, if I may, Madam Chair. I won't take long. Um, this room is, is, a, is, a, is in progress. It's a work in progress. Um, and for the regents that weren't here last time and as we used it for the first time, I just want you to know the, the dais will be expanded. We'll be bringing in our 90-inch 90, our 90 uh, screens uh, for a better effect and, and, and visual uh, support. Um, we, will, we will add two spaces as we spread the dais out. Um, myself and general counsel will be back up there with you all. This is a temporary uh, setup. Um, and there will be electronics and the like for you all to queue in and communicate and the like. Uh, the screen that we have as a loaner that the, the company gave us to, to check out, we wanted to kind of put out there for a little demo today. Each one of the stations will have uh, a screen as well. Uh, one other item that has evolved is the board dining room. Um, currently what we have here is a workroom slash uh, closed session room and we're using it kind of as a dining room. But we will have one connected directly to this exit immediately to the left, which will be a, which is currently a classroom that would be um, very nicely suited. And we think, um, as John and I were talking, 25 to 30 guests total will, will be supported by it. But I wanted to give you that little commercial because, uh, every, you know, it's, it's important. That's how this room is evolving. Um, slash, I will put an, another commercial out there. There will be some community use. Um, for the, with this room, the community will have access to, to, to some of this room and, and, and the like. Um, and just to, to remind everybody that there is more community, community programming space, um, much comparable to this square footage at our new Oso Creek campus. And so that is coming too. Uh, and there is also space at our Windward campus. West campus, remember. So uh, anyway, uh, that's my report. Madam Chair, the Regents, if there are any questions, I'll be glad to answer. Are there any questions for Dr. Escamilla? Um, I would like to um, say that probably with the exception of uh, Mr. Bennett, because I know this is his favorite book. <laughs> that is. It is. I, I would have to second that, uh, <laughs> that, that this is uh, really just a wealth of information and good uh, historic information as well. So if you do have <clears throat> questions about it, please let Dr. Escamilla please. or Dr. Villarreal know. Uh, Dr. Natalie Villarreal know, um, and they'd be happy to, to help you walk through it, but it is a, uh, a wonderful document. I did have to give you credit because I know that you love it best. I know you do. He, he, is, the re <laughs> he is the region I hear from uh, most on that one. So, Simone, he needs some competition. We need some, we need some more questions, so I'm available anytime. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, moving on to Regents reports, um, we did not have an opportunity to talk about this at our last meeting uh, because the information had just been announced between the time we posted the agenda and um, the, uh, the actual meeting itself, but wanted to let you all know that both Dr. Escamilla and I will be serving on the Texas Commission on Community College Finance. Um, the, the commission uh, was passed as part of the uh, legislature this past session um, it is uh, by statute there will be uh, four representatives appointed by the governor three by the lieutenant governor and three by the speaker of the house in addition the Texas Association of Community Colleges has an appointment as does the Community College Association of Texas trustees I am representing CAT as the organizational representative, and Dr. Escamilla was appointed by Governor Abbott to one of the four seats that, that he has. Um, the the uh, commission will be looking at viable funding and sustainable funding for community colleges. Uh, we are to have a report to the, legis to the 88th legislature uh, by uh, January of 2023 with some specific recommendations. It's not just a let's, uh, we need more money kind of commission. We're actually gonna be looking at the state portion of funding formulas and, some, the, and then there are some alternate areas that, that, that the commission can look at as well. Uh, be led by Woody Hunt, who out of El Paso, and Mr. Hunt 
also is very involved with the Texas Association of Community Colleges as the chair of their Business Advisory Council. Sorry, I'm not going through the, the presentation by slide. I apologize for that. Um, uh, but but we have, uh, we're really excited about the opportunities there. It is extremely rare that, that two individuals from one college would be serving on the commission. Uh, but I'm grateful that uh, Dr. Escamilla will be there and allow me to, to be the trustee voice representing our 400 plus trustees across the state uh, in community colleges. So I wanted to officially report that to you all and see if you have any questions or condolences for us. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you, thank you, yeah. We're very, we're very excited about the work. I, I will tell you that uh, Dr. Natalie Villarreal and Dr. Escamilla have already created a shared drive uh, so that all the background information uh, is, is accessible to me because there's going to be a lot of information as we go through this. And I just appreciate the fact that, that he and I are going to be able to commiserate together as we, as we go through this process over the next year or so. I uh, also wanted to have an opportunity for each of the board members who attended the uh, College Trustee Association Annual Conference slash Board of Trustees Institute to provide just a, a quick overview. Um, I'm gonna start with um, and, and provide just a little bit of context. Uh, the, the, typically these are two separate sessions. Uh, one, the Board of Trustees Institute held in March and the annual conference for the association held in June of each year and there, this year, because of COVID and, and all the things that happened, decided to combine those. And I think we had really great feedback from our trustees statewide uh, that attended. We had record attendance from both trustees as well as overall numbers. We had uh, pushing 150 individuals who participated in person and virtually. Um, so it was a, a really good conference. Um, the outtake of the conference uh, was a, uh, an action plan that those of us uh, who were there on Saturday morning had kind of created three or four bullet points. It is an action plan for those of us that were there that we're gonna bring back to you all at our board retreat. Uh, and it's an action plan around student success and student success metrics. Uh, so it's not something that we necessarily will adopt. We, we certainly won't adopt it before the full board has had an opportunity to provide that, in, that input in, into what is happening. Uh, but, but so I'm real excited about the, the opportunities there. I know, Mr. Bennett, you participated a couple of years ago at the Board of Trustees Institute, uh, and several of us have, have done some, some trustee data, uh, student data work in the past. But, but I thought overall it was a really good conference. And I will tell you that one of the main speakers that I heard out of it that, that uh, was an eye opener for me was uh, Dr. Panwan, uh, who spoke on diversity and inclusion and equity. And, and talked about both the visible traits of our students as well as the invisible traits of our students and how when we're talking about diversity, we're talking about all of those things. And so it's not just about what, what someone presents that you can see, but understanding who may come from, uh, maybe they're a first generation college student, maybe they're a veteran, uh, maybe they're a working parent, but there's all kinds of invisible traits uh, that, that, that students come to college with that are important for us to think about when we're talking about diversity, inclusion, and equity. So that was one of the most powerful sessions for me personally. Um, so I'm gonna let those that participated just jump in and tell me what, uh, maybe what, what one or two things that you really got out of the session. All right, well, I'd be glad to Mr. start. Um, and this may have been obvious to more experienced uh, regents, um, but when they started talking about um, uh, the students that we get, and they may not be sophisticated, their parents may not have gone to college, one of the things that they end up doing is meandering um, and not focusing on their career path or, or their, um, their goals. Um, and so, one of our objectives may be guided pathways with more um, counseling, um, keep people focused, because we do, the longer a student is, on, is, is going to school and has not gotten their certification, has not gotten their degree, the more opportunity for us to lose them. Um, and um, 
that, that was not something my parents allowed me to do, meander. Um, so that was kind of a foreign concept to me. Um, but then the, stix, the statistics bear it out, um, that we've got a lot of students who are meandering, um, taking a long time to get their degrees, um, to achieve their goals. Um, and I can't help but wonder how many we lose in that process. So that, that was the big takeaway for me. Sure, it was a, a wonderful opportunity for me, um, coming especially from the K-12 world, uh, to be able to get into this new um, educational level. And just a couple of things. Um, one of the statements that really, because my work is always, you know, uh, college ready, getting those students college ready, college ready, college ready. And um, they put a little spin on it and said, uh, we need to continue to, to get our students college ready, but our college is student ready. And I thought that that was really strong. That was really strong. And, uh, and I know uh, Regent Goddess and I attended a, uh, a session on uh, diversity, equity, and, and accessibility. And you know, in South Texas, we often, when we think of diversity, or I'll, I'll say when I think of diversity, because of my experiences in, in schools, I've always thought uh, 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 minorities. Um, so you think of your Anglo, your uh, black, and your Hispanic uh, groups of students that we always separate and see how they're doing, but really looking at diversity uh, deeper and that it's gender and it's age and it's uh, transgender and it's uh, 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 all a sexual orientation, a religion, really looking at diversity. And the last thing that I'll tell you is just um, the pride that I had uh, to say that I was a Del Mar uh, regent. I think we have uh, uh, one of the finest presidents and I think we have one of the finest uh, staffs and I was so proud to be able to tell people that I was from Del Mar, so thank you all for the opportunity. Mr. Carson? Yeah, I think that uh, the biggest thing I enjoyed, uh, the doctor's speech also on, on diversity and equity and inclusion, uh, one of the things that, that I got out of one of the late, last sessions I was at was from Tarrant County College and had to do with strategic goals. And, you, and when you put something together, when we go to working on it in our, in our, in our retreat or our workshop, trying to come up with a one pager, something that you can actually carry along with you and share with the community and share with students and share with people that, that, that are gonna bring these goals to fruition. You don't want to develop a big old 25 page or 100 page booklet that you're going to stick on a shelf. And this isn't just something that I learned, like I said, that would be beneficial at Del Mar College. I mean, I've served on various governmental entities and, and I think this, is, this would be a really good practice for us to come up with something that we might be able to incorporate and something we can actually carry along or carry on a little, in a little card that we might be able to put in, into our wallets or into our purses. And, uh, the other thing was, again, uh, looked at the, uh, you kind of want a benchmark. First off, like, like Dr. Virial said, I was real proud to be saying that I'm rep representing Del Mar College and uh, I'm the Board of Trustees and we're going to look to see how we can continue to improve the college because, of course, there's a lot of goals that, that we want to meet and we want to make sure we achieve. But uh, looking, you look at, at other institutions, other colleges, other uh, higher learning institutions and there was a um, the Alamo group uh, out of San Antonio uh, they just received the Aspen award I guess and it's a national award for small colleges and I went to one of their workshops and again they talked about uh, making guided pathways board policy so we figure out how do we work that into our policy but then you have to also commit dollars like uh, our chair was talking the other day, do we need more money for advisors in order to be able to help those students that might feel they need more direction in order to not meander, like uh, Regent uh, Bill Kelly mentioned, so that they can actually achieve their goals, their educational and their career goals. And then, uh, and then the, the last thing that, uh, that I took out of there was also, you have to be able to also put together some performance matrix so that you can go back and you can see, we've got key performance indicators that we get regular um, reports on, but um, what I liked about what they were doing 
was that they were actually getting committees together to work on those metrics that they had set themselves in order to show the students the, the love that they need in order to reach the goals they want. And they, the, the committee and the, the, their own colleagues measure their, their faculty members against those metrics so that those, those faculty members that say, hey, we don't want to, the extra work and we don't want to have to go about these changes uh, can, can be held. Often the, the ones that speak the loudest are the ones that can't reach those measured goals, right? So eventually those poor performers get weeded out of, out of, out of your, out of your, I won't say out of, out of your group. And so again, uh, not by, not, by, not, not done uh, by, by punishment, but, but they kind of leave on their own because they're not able, able to meet the, meet the mark. And so it also helps for greater morale among faculty members. And so again, some of those things that they were successful in doing are some of the things that I'd like to see us start talking about. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Garza. Dr. Adami? You know, it's, it's always great when we could meet with other colleges and see how they, they, see how they perform and what they do towards student retention and pathways. You know, Del Mar has led in a lot of these efforts and what they're doing, we've already done. You know, so it's, it's always, uh, uh, when it's always, um, uh, you know, as uh, everybody mentioned here, to be proud from Del Mar College because we do have innovators. Uh, and again, um, uh, uh, I appreciate everybody being there and everybody who's on the board because it's always important to meet with other colleagues from other parts of the state uh, and look forward to uh, continue collaboration with the colleges. Thank you, Dr. Dami. Dr. Turner? Um, I don't think there's any le anything left to say, so I can see us say ditto, 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 ditto. But the only thing I really wanted to add is really moving colleges to meet students' needs. It's all about achievement, and it's about advising, it's helping students know what they want to do so they don't spend extra time, extra money on college and prepping them. And so the importance of advising them before they even sign up for their first class is really having that just front-centered for these students before them coming in. I understand when they're 18, they will probably meander a lot because they don't have those life experiences that are guiding them. So I think the tightening on the curriculum, really using that guided pathways, what are you we were just overwhelmed with information, especially being new on the board and just coming from education from a different point of view. But I do, and it's so important, those invisible traits. We have so many students that one package just doesn't fit all. And just to recognize those individual traits and to really help with the tutoring and help give them support in their classrooms. We don't want to drop students. We don't want them to restart. We don't want them. We want to provide that support while they are in their classes so that you know they are successful and that they build on themselves and they build on their own self-esteem as they're going through Del Mar. This might be just a start for them, and we want to create that love for learning that they might have lost along the way. But it was very, very in inspirational. I was so motivated by being there. Thank you, Dr. Turner. Anything else? Thank you all for taking the time to attend. We had uh, all of our new regents there, along with uh, Dr. Dom Adami and myself, to make sure they behaved themselves. <laughs> <laughs> and they did, and they did. <laughs> Thank you all very much. We'll move on. <laughs> We'll move on to our staff reports, and we will begin with our annual uh, tax abatement update. Uh, Dr. Lenora Keyes and Mike Culberson from the Economic Development Corporation are here. Mike, thanks for joining us today. Ms. Keyes, would you like to introduce the topic? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, Regent Scott and all of our regents. I'm very pleased to uh, introduce and share uh, Mike Culberson is the Vice President and Chief Operating Officer at the Corpus Christi Regional Economic Development Corporation. And Mike comes to us every year to give, provide the uh, update is where we stand on the tax abatements that we've offered. And this is really his presentation. Thank you, Mike. And, uh, 
really, it's easy for right. me just to do this. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Uh, every time I get to meet a lot of uh, executives from a lot of companies, and I always ask them, so you're vice president. Are you like one heartbeat away from the president? Or are you like at McDonald's, the fry guy? He might be assistant manager, but if the manager dies, he's not moving up. Well, I'm that guy at the EDC. First off, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of change, uh, change tracks here. And I want to thank you. I want to thank you for being such a partner for you and, and Ms. Keyes and the Regents for being such a partner in workforce development. You can't imagine how, how difficult it becomes when we're doing negotiation with companies and what do you have? You know, what can we do? Um, aviation, we talked about aviation, you know, the, the, the uh, hangar and, uh, and grants for that. Um, the Eagleford was blowing up. No one had uh, CDL drivers and you, you responded with the truck driving uh, simulators. Um, now we have uh, process technology one and process technology two. And I don't know, by the end of this, it'll all go all the way out to the road and then back again. But also the small business uh, assistance grants from the type A and on the 12th, we'll go before council for the type B. So we have PTAC, uh, Procurement Technical Assistance Center, which is here in the SBDC, that helps companies um, get government contracts at all levels, state, federal, uh, military, all of those things. The uh, CRC, which uh, uh, then Councilman Garza, you know, worked with us on to, uh, you know, you bring in all these companies, Mike, uh, how are small businesses going to get into that? Um, we, we have... Um, internships. Internships have become such an important part. It's a way for small businesses to get a student that, and they work in their uh, major, and they only have to pay minimum wage. The uh, type A, soon to be type B, pays another five dollars to help that, help the student, and the student gets, uh, gets a lot of experience. The small business gets, you know, cheap labor that's in what they need. And then finally, the SBDC counselors, not I know that uh, the state has shorted you and, and it was very difficult and you were gonna go down to two counselors. The type A stepped up and, and brought it up to three, but could you imagine, well, I cannot imagine what would have happened during the COVID when small businesses were trying to find out who can help them and what they needed had the, ED, had the SBDC only had two counselors. I mean, it was huge and I will tell you that the counselors didn't fill out with them. It wasn't through the small business. It was through PPP loans, it's ETA loans, all of those. But they helped them through that. And I want to thank you for that. And, you know, I, I hope you realize just how important Del Mar is to workforce here um, and how important it is to the EDC for us to present that, you know, that you're such a partner when we're talking workforce. So now on to the business. This is really nice because you can look up. You don't have to look down. All right. So uh, just so you know, the EDC is, uh, is, uh, provides compliance reviews for the city, for Nueces County, for San Patricio County, for Del Mar, uh, for San Patricio Municipal uh, County uh, Drainage District. We also do for Type A. Uh, for those of you who don't remember, Type A is a sales tax. You pay uh, one-eighth. Actually, you pay three-eighths. Uh, one-eighth is for the seawall. Uh, to make sure, sure that comes up. Uh, the Arena Center, which is American Bank, and then uh, one-eighth for economic development. So that economic development, which brings in, you know, like $4 million a year, half of it goes to economic development, uh, a major part of it goes to roads, and then 500000 goes to affordable housing. And now with Type B, so we replaced the Type A with Type B, now the Type B board will be coming up. So what do I do? So I'm a certified public accountant is licensed by the state of Texas and I do all of that CPE and all that stuff that no one else wants to do. So one of the things we have to do is when you do a, an agreement, you say you will have this many employees, they will get paid this much, they have to have uh, health insurance, you have to have investments, you have to be completed by so, and I go through. So for those of you who don't know, IRS form 941, a uh, business has to present this to file this with the IRS every quarter, and at the end of the year, they have to file a 940, which is annual. It tells me who's working, how much they're getting paid, how much insurance they're paying for. I go through their audited financials to ensure that they have done what they were said they were gonna do, either through, you know, and I've gone through boxes and boxes of invoices 
uh, to ensure that they made their investment. And then also Texas Workforce Commission. The Texas Workforce Commission has a great, great uh, um, report. And in this report, it has now, I just go in and look at it and walk away. I don't take anything. But it has name, it has social, it has addresses. So if somebody says, hey, I'm going to create 20 jobs, and I walk in and three of them are addresses in San Antonio or uh, Houston, you know, they're, they're, um, they're headquarters people that just assigned, those don't count. Now, if they have 23 and three of them are in Houston, that's fine. But I make sure that people are there. And then I review all of their assertions. There are some assertions that, uh, that are not all those uh, basic things that we talked about. And then I report to, then I send a report every, uh, when I do these. So um, tax abatements uh, usually come up at the end of January 20, uh, 31st. Uh, we don't get the TWC reports for a little bit later. So you'll see those then. So your abatements. These are your abatements that you've done. Um, you have uh, MNG, which is now uh, CC Polymers. We'll talk a little bit about that. Vistalpine. It was their docks, okay? And since their docks came over the land, over the water, uh, that is part of Corpus Christi city limits, and we'll talk about that. Castleton, we were really happy about that. Castleton, think of that as a, uh, as a, um, as a manufacturer. Uh, unfortunately, right after uh, you approved this, uh, Slumberjay bought them and said that Corpus was not part of their area that they wanted to, so they didn't do it. Uh, and then, oh, and then we had the docks on the other side. So let me talk a little bit about that. They call it the, uh, the Ingleside, the Ingleside rule. Um, Tex uh, Corpus and Ingleside are fighting over boundaries. You know, they said that if you have a you have a pier and it goes over, then that part is in Corpus Christi. And then the courts ruled that it wasn't. And so because of that, you no longer have the docks in Vistalpina. And then uh, Epic Y-Grade, Epic Y-Grade was, a, uh, was a, a midstream. But if you take a look at what they've done, uh, in the first year, they had like 190. Now they're at 257. And they're talking about expanding that. So that has gone very well. So. Epic Y grade. So I'm going to throw another one at you, Topaz. Topaz is, uh, is the uh, power plants that came online in 2008. So that was actually before my time, believe it or not. Um, it is made up of Barney Davis, which is out in uh, Flower Bluff. Uh, and it used to be two uh, CPNL um, a combined cycle, but now it's natural gas. And then one, Noises Bay, which is on the Inner Harbor. Those finished up, they had the, you can see the investment, they promised 630 and they got 900 million. They finished construction, they did everything they were supposed to. And like, like it's supposed to, once, once they finished all of that, then the tax abatement finishes and then you move on with life. And then you get the full tax. M&G, which is CC Polymers, uh, they're working, they're working hard. So m and is going along, everything's going great. And then uh, the company has, Many difficulties, and they stop. They go into bankruptcy, and then they were bought out of bankruptcy by three other companies, and we'll talk about that in a second. Their investment has always kept up. They've done very well. They're starting to remobilize to finish that. But at anything, it'll be finished in 2024, the, the, the agreement. So you won't give any more. Uh, and then Epic is doing fine. They, they started in 2018. They finished 2020. They've done everything they can. So net of incentives, so you give incentives. And I, and I want to talk a little bit about when we do incentives. Um, we do these to, to entice companies to come here. And I know that it'd be really good if no one gave incentives and they just made a decision based on where it is. But I will tell you, as, as one of our board members who sits on a major corporation said, without this, it would have, knowing that taxes are 2%, are 2 that it impacted our, our, uh, our income by 2% for 10 years, we would not have come here. We would have gone to someplace else. So that's important, and I, and I want you to understand that, and I want you to understand that once it's there, it's there forever. I mean, even when Sherwin Alumina went away, it had been here 52 years. Take a look around at these things. Uh, we, were doing a, we were looking at the history of Valero's, uh, their, uh, their plant, 
has, you know, was 1984, and that was the last refinery that was completed in the United States. So these, these things last a long time. You can take a look at uh, taxes without, um, and then once you have, because when they're taxes without, there's nothing. There's usually a green field there, just sitting there. So here are the funds you can get off as much as uh, 29 million. This is for 10 years, and this is net of the incentive. This, you know, I'm not double counting. This is net of the incentive. So let's talk about MNG just real quick, just to refresh your memory. So CC Polymers. If you can stop is, just a second is, and go back to that slide, that's total taxes, not Del Mar taxes, or is that Del Mar taxes? Del Mar taxes. Del Mar taxes. I just wanted to clarify. Yep. Okay. If you take a look at our website at our annual, annual. Uh, annual report, you'll see this broken out for everyone. I mean, not, not it'll have like New Oasis uh, school districts and, and San Patricio school districts, but that's like that. So, so coming out of uh, bankruptcy, uh, M&G was bought by three companies. Alpac, which is uh, one of the, actually was number two or one, depending on PET, which is uh, polyethylene, off ethylene. And, so that, it actually had to go through and get, and get uh, Department of Justice approval. Indorama, which is a, uh, it's a Thailand company, but it's really Indian owned, and then the Far Eastern group out of Taipei. Um, they got together and they are the ones that are putting the group, you know, getting the band back together. You know, they have uh, Maro, for, who was the construction manager, to uh, remobilize and finish that. So. I stand by for any questions. Any questions for Mike? Great. Yes, sir. Uh, the topaz, so it says it, be, it was going to be finished in 2015, so we've been receiving taxes since Yes, then. sir. And so you had taxes over a 10-year period, which was $29 million. That's an average of about $3 million, almost $3 million a year. So that, that's in perpetuity as long as it, the business Correct. continues well, to run, right? I, if you ever saw my spreadsheet, you'll actually see taxes go down, and then when a new one comes up, they'll go up, because of, I take into appreciation. I do every, you know, I don't, I don't tell you that, hey, it's 900 million for the rest of our lives. It's not, I, okay. I'd appreciate it. And I'm right. sure they do too, but yeah. uh, <laughs> I'm sure there's lawsuits against school districts that do that, but anyway. <laughs> All right, thank you, Mike. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mike, for being here. Right. We appreciate the annual visit, and, and especially when we have new regents, it's helpful to put these into context. Uh, I don't know if we'll see you again, if y'all have anything in the hoppers, but Dr. Escamilla and Lenora will keep us. <laughs> we're trying, we're trying. We're thank trying, you. thank you, sir. I wanted to say thank you to Mike, especially. In the beginning, what he was sharing with you is all the help they give us with our type A and type B funding. Uh, Regent Garza is very familiar with that. I think we're hitting about up to $9 million over the last several years that we've received. And it's through Mike does all the preliminary analysis. And none of those, uh, none of the applications for type A money moves forward without their recommendation to the CCRDC board. Then it goes to type AB board and then to the city council. And then Mike does all the audit and verification to get us our money. And so none of this would happen if it wasn't really no, honestly, for the relationship and the work that Mike does, and, and his work is prime, primo, as far as the numbers. So thank you very much, Mike. Thank you. <laughs> A round of applause. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> and did you have a board member in the audience? Is that who I see? You have a board member, Mr. Hamilton? Past chairman, thank you for being here, sir. Uh, we'll move on to our legislative update, Dr. Villarreal. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Dr. Escamilla, and our regents. Wait here just a second. So while Zach is getting that ready, um, I'd like to take the opportunity today um, to update you on what is happening with our Texas legislature and how it is impacting our community colleges at the state. Now the advocacy work that we do here at the college um, at the state and national level is part of the college's strategic plan. 
So it is under goal number five, our workforce development, community partnerships, and advocacy. So as you can see by these dates, the 87th legislature has been very busy. Uh, they went through the regular session and ended on May 31st of this past year. And I did give you an update on that. There were uh, probably a few hundred bills that impacted our community college faculty, staff, and our students. They went then into the uh, first special session. Governor Abbott felt that there was just some unfinished business that they really needed to focus on. So that went from everything from border security, um, family violence prevention, um, transgender students, um, uh, working on payments for retired teachers and critical race theory. So as they went through the se special session, they ended up going back into that second special session to really try to finish all of that up. And so community colleges really didn't have a whole lot of advocacy work in those first two sessions. Then we hit this third special session, which was the 20th. And that's when Governor Abbott decided that um, we could for, for now start working on redistricting. And as you know, uh, our representative Todd Hunter is the chairman of that, um, of that redistricting session. So he has been hard at work at that. But also with the third session has been $16 billion of federal appropriations. So back in April, I reported to you about the American Rescue Plan Act. And that was signed into law by President Biden back in March. That included $1.9 trillion in COVID-19 relief funding. And it also included the $40 billion that you've been hearing from um, our CFO, Mr. Garcia, and VP Keys, that for $40 billion in the Higher Education Emergency Relief Fund, which again, you'll hear an update on that in a little bit. So this $16 billion in federal appropriations came to the governor, um, to the governors of the state. So this is coming from that, um, that appropriation. So we do know that from the $16 billion that they have to dole out to the state, $7 billion is already across the board been given out to unemployment insurance. So right now that leaves $9 billion for our state agencies and organizations to advocate for. And what we're hearing right now is that the Senate has already received about $30 billion in requests. So you have in front of you the uh, third legislative session um, advocacy packet from the Texas Association of Community Colleges and the Community College Association of Texas Trustees. So what our group has decided to do is take a request for $325 million the first part of that is to strengthen our community college capacity funds. And the second part is to continue to advocate that our community colleges are best suited to meet immediate workforce needs for the state to really boost our economy and keep us going. 250 million of that is specifically looking at um, giving our colleges the ability to, um, to buy things in, in technology, um, equipment, online instruction, and then there's also a 75 million that is being requested to increase our true initiative, which is the Texas reskilling and upskilling through education. That bill was passed, we talked about in the regular session, and community colleges received 25 million as a grant um, to, to use again to get um, the immediate needs of the workforce met. So that 300, I'm sorry, that 250 million for strengthening community college capacity what, um, what we have asked the state to do is to appropriate in form of a formula. The formula is college enrollment rate amongst the high school graduates in our region. So they're taking that rate and plus the proportion of the unemployment insurance claimants in the region. So that is the ask that our community colleges are asking for right now. Does anybody have any questions on that? It's pretty straightforward. Um, I don't have a whole lot of information as to what's going to happen in the next two weeks. There's a couple of weeks left. We know that the Senate has already asked for everybody's requests. And uh, Dr. Escobie and I have spoken with uh, Senator Hinojosa, and they continue to stay very committed to our community colleges in the area and the state. Um, unfortunately, there are only two weeks left. And what we do know is the House continues to stay focused on redistricting. So. Um, we're not sure what's going to happen within the next couple of weeks. So we're gonna to continue to work with our legislators 
um, and make sure that they understand where our request is coming from and that our adv advocacy continues to be on behalf of our students, our faculty and staff, and really getting our state back to where it needs to be um, after the COVID-19 pandemic. So hopefully the next time that I meet with y'all, we'll be able to give you a little bit more information on what happened at the end of the special session. Um, there are some options that could happen. They could go into a fourth session. Um, they could also decide to wait and appropriate the money for another two years. Uh, the governor does that have that ability. So hopefully we'll have some more answers for you in the next couple of weeks. And then in March, um, we'll have just come back from the ACCT uh, National Legislative Summit where we'll be advocating the legislative level, I'm sorry, at the federal level, and we'll be able to give you an update on what is happening nationally. Um, I'm sure you've heard in the news there's a lot going on, especially with the infrastructure bill. Um, there's free community college, that kind of terminology is being thrown around, as well as infrastructure in terms of technology as well, increasing technology and Wi-Fi for our higher education institutions. So that'll come up in March. Thank you very much, Dr. Villarreal. Thank you. Uh, next, we're gonna talk about the Higher Education Emergency Relief Funds. And uh, while Mr. Um, Garcia and Ms. Keys are coming up, uh, Dr. Escamilla, do you have some opening comments? Madam Chair, thank you for uh, this opportunity to come to you, Regents, um, and talk about the Higher Education Emergency Fund, uh, otherwise known as HERF. Funds. Um, this is a sizable amount of money um, that has come to us um, as a result of the pandemic. And as I uh, mentioned at the last meeting, that the uh, we would have come to you um, a month prior, but because of the shift, because of excuse me, the way the uh, pandemic uh, spiked um, with with the with the, COVID, with the uh, Delta variant and so forth, it caused us to shift our strategies and respond. And so our situational approach to all of this has delayed us by a little, by a month um, in reporting. That being said, we still have deadlines and, and guidelines um, that we're adhering to that Mr. Garcia is gonna talk about. And um, I just want y'all to know that this is a, uh, this is, I'm, I'm look, what, I'm, what we're looking for here, this is a, a, a very sizable grant from the, from the US, uh, from the federal government and our, our approach, our approach really does look at, at putting the student first, and we are looking for uh, input and feedback and those kinds of things, and the discussion doesn't have to end today. However, that being said, um, we, um, again, with, with the guidelines and timelines that go with all of those uh, types of things in front of us, um, there are certain things that you will find, certain initiatives that we uh, could not wait on and such as granting the, uh, the students. You've heard me say that before with other uh, types of HERF, uh, the, the, the predecessor to our HERF dollars. And so there's, there, you'll find that there were some dollars um, that we had to expend with the students that were enrolled at the, at the, at the, at the time, uh, including students uh, of the 2019, 2020, excuse me, 2020, 2021 year. That being said, Mr. Garcia, would you take over the presentation? Yes, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, uh, members of the board. Uh, thank you all uh, for your patience in waiting for this presentation. Dr. Valeria has promised I was gonna introduce that term into my language. <laughs> so uh, I wanna begin with a definition of agility provided by Leo M. Tillman in his most recent book, How to Navigate uh, the Unknown and Seize Opportunity in a World of Disruption. Agility is the organization capacity to effectively detect, assess, and respond to environmental changes in ways that are purposeful, dec decisive, and grounded in a will to win. In our current operating environment, Del Mar College, a Del Mar College win is to successfully navigate uh, through the pandemic and the current uh, economic conditions with the Higher Education Emergency Funding also recognized as HERF. This one-time federal grant provides our students with emergency grant funding and allows the college to enhance its operations to navigate through the existing pandemic. If planned well, there is also the possibility that these investments will enhance our uh, infrastructure as it relates to instruction and student operating. 
uh, services that will have long-term implications. We begin today uh, with an update on the HERF funding that is available for the college and an introduction to the cross-functional advisory team. Uh, we will then transition to the planned activities for the st student emergency aid portion of the grant and we will close the presentation with the planned activities for defraying operating expenses associated with the pandemic. So let's get started. So the federal government's response to the pandemic and economic recovery includes a proliferation of fiscal stimuli, funding that started with the HERF-1 under the federal provisions of the CARES Act back in March of 2020. The results of the college's spending plan for this first go around of funding, her funding, was presented to the board back in March. Today's presentation will focus on the HERF 2 and 3 grant funding. At the start of, the, of this year, HERF 2 and 3 funding was released under the federal provisions of the Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations and the American Rescue Federal Government Fiscal Plan. Del Mar College's grant total award is valued $31.5 million. The objectives of these federal dollars are narrow with the emphasis on preventing, preparing, and responding to the COVID-19. The college has two major spending plan categories. This includes the student emergency uh, award valued at $11.5 million. These federal dollars are for our students enrolled during the COVID-19 national emergency. Our student is not required to complete a free application for federal student aid, often referred to as FAFSA, to access these emergency dollars. Instead, they can also access these emergency dollars through the college's emergency HERF application process. Further information of this category will be provided later in this presentation. The second category is the Institutional Use and Minority Service Institution Grant Awards. The combined total value of those two is $20 million. The purpose of these grants are to defray expenses associated with the pandemic, including lost revenues, technology costs associated with transitioning to distance education training for faculty and staff, and student retention and re-engagement initiatives. Further information on this category will be provided later in this presentation. Are there any questions on this slide? Okay. All right, so there's complexity in designing a spending plan uh, because of the large dollar amount and the narrow related compliance requirements of the grant funding. To address this matter, the college has uh, two cross-functional teams made up of individuals possessing deep technical expertise in their respective fields of operation. Each team member is tasked with developing a spending plan that focuses on compliance, strategy, operational agility, and innovation. What you will see before you is the team of the Direct Student Emergency Assistant Advisory Group. Okay, so on this slide is the second team. It's the listing of the Institutional Use Advisory Team. Are there any questions on these two slides? Okay, thank you. So Ms. Keyes will lead us into the discussion of the college's HERF spending plan. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. The college advisory group uh, focused on needs of our students during COVID-19 and how to most effectively utilize the student's emergency assistance funds. The following will describe the various requirements as set out by the U.S. Department of Education, the categories of funds awarded to students, and strategies to engage students in the program. Approximately $11.5 million will be distributed to students in a variety of needs-based strategies. And now Patricia Benavides Dominguez will go into more detail. Patricia? This slide defines uh, the Department of Ed requirements regarding HERF awards. Students can use HERF funds to assist with cost of attendance, tuition, food, housing, health care. The deadline for HERF uh, to award money is May 20, 2022. 
Additionally, her funds cannot be used to fund scholarships. The HERF distribution. DMC dispersed uh, her funds over a period of semesters. DMC based HERF awarding on the following. Students with the most need on the results of FAFSA EFC. The range for the most need was zero to 10,000. Students mainly stated the use of the HERF uh, funds was to assist with the medical, uh, technology, housing, food, and childcare. DMC has uh, directly awarded to students a total of 6.4 million in HERF. The breakdown of awards is as follows. HERF 2 for summer one, we have 1.927.15 uh, awarded to 4,752 students that we assisted and the average award for summer one was 405.51. For summer two, HERF 3 was awarded and we awarded $420,000, yeah. Uh, and then we assisted 773 students and the average award was 543.85. For fall HERF 3, the, uh, the amount that we awarded was 4,052,201. Uh, students assisted was 5,024 and the average award was 806.56. I have a quick question here. Yes, ma'am. Are students required to be currently enrolled to receive those funds? What is the enrollment requirement, or is there one? No, there's not. Okay. They just have to have been a student at some point in the last 12 months or any time? Or how, I mean, is there any? Since March. Since March. Okay. At some point since March, they have to have been a student. Yes. 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 <laughs> Whatever it was declared a national emergency moving forward due to COVID-19. So the student was enrolled during that time period and they qualify. Uh, what we've done though, as you can see, to reach all these students it was important that we have a good campaign. Uh, and because many students were not really aware that these funds were available. College Relations prepared a variety of strategies to support the student assistance campaign. You may have seen the billboard ads that looks just like this one. I've seen it on the highway myself. Uh, heard the radio spots, extensive social media messaging, and the college's website provides detailed information along with print ads and the application itself. During spring uh, uh, for 2022, DMC attempts to award uh, $5.1 million in HERF. And that shows uh, the bulk of the student pieces that will go out. Uh, the next will be how we're going to uh, impact the college with the institutional use funding. The college advisory group coordinated the plan for institutional funding and minority serving institutional grant that totaled over $20 million. The following provides information on the U.S. Department of Education requirements, the overall budget plan, and the various initiatives. The requirements for approved uses of the funding comes under the purview of the U.S. Department of Education and the Higher Education Emergency Relief Act. All expenditures must be tied to defraying costs associated with the college's response and preparation in dealing with COVID-19. Examples include lost revenues, technology improvements associated with distance or remote learning or education, and also college processes, faculty and staff training. Health and safety enhancements are included and they provide that they must provide and be tied to improving conditions that ensure a safer learning environment or facilitate learning with key safety protocols and also for staff safety. Additional funds can be allocated for emergency use to students and to incentivize vaccinations. 
And again, with these funds must be extended or purchased by May of 22. Each of the initiatives that are shown here meet the criteria established in the grant and will be discussed in more detail by the, uh, as we go through the other slides. However, some of the initiatives qualify under the grant for indirect funding, as you see across the top, the different columns. For indirect funding is basically capturing an additional amount of funds that are tied directly to the expenditures based on certain criteria within the grant requirements. I want to point out not all funding re, uh, meets the requirement for indirect. For example, let's consider the funding under the line vaccination, and it should be vaccination initiatives. That plan, over 50% of the amount can be claimed as indirect and added to the base funding to reach the 1.9 million. It is the combination of base funding plus indirect to reach the total for all initiatives. Now, Dr. Halcom will provide information on professional development as we work down the list of initiatives. As you know, faculty and staff have had to work remotely during the COVID pandemic. It's critical to further train faculty and staff to operate in a remote learning environment, expand remote learning programs, and delivery of instruction. This contributes directly to student success. In order to help our staff and faculty, the following type of professional development is recommended. Train the trainers, for example, in which well-versed faculty and staff will work with their colleagues on the new and enhanced online environments or in fact in the use of equipment as well. Develop new Canvas courses. Um, we have faculty that have been doing online instruction for many years. They're, they're very knowledgeable and they can help develop more courses in online for other people who aren't as well versed. And so that's, that's really important for each of our programs. Faculty and staff need to further attend workshops, conferences for online learning. We need to hire part-time workers to help in the training. If we have special training sessions, for example, e-learning may set up some training sessions or perhaps IT does, and they need extra hands to make that happen. We need to get specialized software, especially for skills-based courses, where we may need some simulations for some of the skills. Then we also need to develop training modules, and we need the in-house training modules that suit the needs of our particular students, our faculty, our staff. Advisor training for remote student learning is important. We need to en enhance advising, of distance learners. Organization, organizations such as NACADA, which you heard about earlier when Letitia was uh, recognized, they identify distant learners to have characteristics that are somewhat different and unique to them. An advisor needs to be very much aware of these characteristics and issues surrounding distance learners. Um, the preparedness for online instruction um, among a student population. They need to look at time management skills, the self-paced learner, are they able to do that? How are we going to advise them appropriately for those online courses? So we really need to enhance in that area. And then our developmental education students that sometimes must go into an online environment, be able, being able to enhance that level of training as well, because they have a unique environment, unique characteristics as well. Then we need to bring in guest speakers, trainers, consultants to also help in this training. And then lastly, upgrading our facilities and equipment even further such as setting up a training room where faculty and staff can go when they need help. All of these things are directly tied to student success. The student is, needs to be directly tied to the instructor or the staff, very critical for that success. 
And next, we're going to have, uh, the next slide will be for Success Outreach Plan, and I believe Patricia's doing that one. Patricia? Although the Strategic Enrollment Management Plan is in development, the following outreach plans will help drive future enrollment by focusing on re-engagement, retention, and supporting students through their educational journey. Uh, some of the campaigns that are in discussion and development with the committee are One More Class campaign, We Take a Class on Us. We are targeting students that uh, in previous terms earned a W or an F or an R. Uh, try a mini mester session on us, for example, uh, an eight week or a May mester. Target uh, zip codes in the, the DMC area with low enrollment and take a free class on us for graduating high school seniors. Next slide will be presented by Tammy McDonald. As Ms. McDonald is coming up, I'd just like to add that there are many more initiatives b besides the six or so, five or six that we presented here. When I asked um, Vice President uh, Patricia to, to bring me a list, um, she could have had a whole separate presentation on the number of initiatives that she wants to execute. So know that uh, I know she's being very discerning amongst that uh, list there. Uh, there's much, much more opportunity still. I just got to add that. Thank you, Ms. McDonald. Thank you. To align with the funding priority to prevent and mitigate the spread of the coronavirus, the college has responded with an employee voluntary vaccination incentive program. This program was implemented on September the 23rd. It is a one-time incentive payment of $200. Eligibility is the current full-time and part-time employees who are fully vaccinated. This program will end on December the 3rd or when available funds are depleted, whichever comes first. We have also responded with a student voluntary vaccination incentive program. It was also implemented on September the 23rd. It is a one-time incentive of a $200 gift card. Um, it is eligible for enrolled students for this fall semester, that's credit, or if someone is taking a continuing education course and to be fully vaccinated. This program will end on December the 10th or when available funds are depleted, whichever comes first. Any questions? I've got one. So how, how have our student and faculty responded to this initiative? All right, as of yesterday afternoon, we had a little over 600 employees who have submitted for the incentive program, and that's right at about 50% of our current active employees. And as of yesterday afternoon, we had approximately 2,200 students who have submitted. And I don't know the percent, but that's 20, 22 percent ish, about 20 percent of currently enrolled. So they're, they're responding well. We still have some time, like I said, we just implemented it and um, it's, it's going well. So when you say 50 percent, are you talking about of our entire uh, employment uh, employees or those that have reported to or have not reported that they vaccinated? Well, we have approximately right now active employees 1,200, but full time and okay. part time. So as of yesterday afternoon, we had a little, we had right at a little over 600 have submitted wow. showing they're fully vaccinated to so participate in the program. Half of the entire workforce. Has submitted and showed that they're fully vaccinated. There could be more. There, uh, there are. I, kn I know there's many others that are fully vaccinated. I'd be one that I'm not going to participate. I'm just letting you all know, but uh, that won't be counted in that. And I suspect there, there are others that have just said, hey, that's behind me. Let's, let's keep going. The other thing I'd like to add is that we learned from our colleagues from around the, uh, around the country. And initially, the team um, had, uh, as per my request, uh, we, we, threw down, we, we threw the number down of $100 and thought about that. And we heard from around the country that they were uh, raising the number substantially. So we, 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 uh, the, the committee, in, in their wisdom, decided to double it. And immediately, you see these numbers. Uh, they surpass, they're surpassing our expectations already, and it's just getting started. I'm curious, are we getting any pushback from those that have already been vaccinated about not getting, well, I didn't get $200 to get vaccinated. If you're currently an active employee and you were already vaccinated, you're eligible because part of it oh. is to mitigate and being vaccinated does help mitigate the spreads. Yep. So those, okay. they get to participate, yes. So I think the answer is no. 
Okay, thank you. Next, we'll have Dr. Larry Lee come up and discuss information technology initiatives. Dr. Lee? Good afternoon. We're going to secure and harden our learning environment through the purchase of a next generation firewall that's supported by AI driven security applications and network services. This will be a major upgrade moving from transactional to transformational that provides improved endpoint device detection spots unusual user or entity behavior activities, provides self-healing operations under a centralized management application for quick threat response, all to deliver operational efficiencies now necessary to meet the ever-changing threat environment in higher education. To support remote learning, we're expanding the college internet bandwidth from one gigabit to 10. We're also purchasing additional laptops to expand our student loaner program, as well as provide laptops to faculty desiring to teach remotely. Additional lecture capture software and video hardware is being procured to support all faculty who choose to teach hybrid or remotely. To remove a student's home computer and software limitations for courses such as those found in architecture, gaming, and GIS, we will provide those instructors a puerto, a virtual desktop application that uses students' home computing device as a display and keyboard. Well, Aperto's cloud servers provides the computing power and video rendering, giving the student the ability to use class course software at home as if their devices were being computed locally. Teachers can instruct, screen share, and manipulate all application objects on the student's device in real time. Aperto can be used by students for group projects or independent studies from home. And finally, to transform office hours from 8 to 5 to 24-7, we will be providing virtual student support on any device for Del Mar students. We are leveraging our experience from the use of Black Belt Help, a service purchased with CARES One funds for IT technical support, now being expanded to the college student support services and financial aid to deliver relevant information on enrollment and the financial aid process at any hour to reduce wait times and frustrations to improve student satisfaction and engagement. Any questions? No questions. I just wanted to say thank you for coming back out of retirement and helping us, Dr. Lee. <laughs> Good to John? see you. We do have a question. I'm yes. sorry. I had a question. On some of the older buildings that have some, you know, their Wi-Fi isn't strong enough, are you able to revamp and improve on some of those facilities? There's Seems, yeah, it seems like there's a couple buildings that might not have total access to Wi-Fi but wasn't yes. real strong. Are, can you use the funds to improve yes. capabilities? Okay, yes. great. And that's what we're defining. Okay, cool. Thanks. Yep. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that, Madam Chair. Is uh, Dr. Lee, retired Dean Emeritus at the college, for those who don't know him, just thank you for Dr. Lee for, for filling in once again uh, in your retirement and our apologies to your wife. <laughs> Health, safety, and phys facility enhancements, approximately $2.7 million. The HERF language is very clear that uh, capital improvements are not allowed, and they have some very strict guidelines on how we can use this. We've worked with faculty, with staff, with the law, and uh, they've issued uh, frequently asked questions about what kinds of uses can we use these funds for. We've been able to identify indoor air quality, and so part of what's happened from this that uh, a lot of really smart engineers are all over this, what can we do? and uh, I'll just call it a plasma air ionizer. Uh, basically what happens is special equipment that can adapt to our existing air handler units and uh, without, and so it will improve the air quality. That these are designed and engineered specifically to help mitigate not just the COVID virus, but mold and other con air contaminants. So it overall improves the air door, indoor air quality. Social distancing furniture. Sounds kind of vague and generic, but a good example is you've all been to a restaurant sooner or later where you can't sit at certain tables, can't sit at certain booths, but if they have a patio, you can go outside. So basically it's about putting more outdoor spaces for our students and our faculty and staff so it meets that criteria of the social distancing. Decontamination. I don't think this will ever go away. I think uh, we bought 55-gallon drums of the, the solutions and we're running through those. We're going to constantly need more backpacks, spray backpacks, just the equipment, the PPE needed to continue to do this because this 
This is not going away. This is with us for a long term. Touchless restroom fixtures and water fountains. During the peak of the virus, we closed off restrooms. We closed off water fountains. So again, they've implemented new technology in water fountains, restrooms, where we can make this where it's safe to use. So we've identified these as priority projects. Questions? Thank you. Okay, so I'm not too sure if I have many words for us. I, I think the picture says it all, right? Lost or revenues, but I'll try. Uh, the HERF 2 and 3 grants also provides funding for lost revenues. The Department of Education, who administers the HERF funding for higher education, defines lost revenues as revenues of a higher education institution that would otherwise would have been expected but were reduced or eliminated as a result of the COVID-19. Uh, this includes tuition and fees, food services, and child care, just to name a few. The college is setting aside $3.5 million for lost uh, uh, revenues. This is a, a, a huge estimate. You know, uh, we'll know better in the coming months. Once the lost revenues, here's the upside. Once the lost revenues is collected by the college, the college can spend the dollars well after the grant period of May 2022. Accordingly, the college will assess in the coming months any additional funding needs of the activities described by my colleagues uh, just right now, or if the funds will be needed to balance the 2022 budget year. Or possibly, uh, knowing Patricia, she'll figure it out, <laughs> how to spend these dollars for uh, other initiatives that focuses on uh, re-engagement, uh, retaining, and supporting uh, student uh, activities or initiatives. So, Madam Chair, members of the board, Mr. President, this concludes the presentation. Uh, if there are no other questions. I had a general question, and, and I don't know that if Dr. Escamilla shared with you. I uh, sent him a story. South Texas College used a portion of their HERF funds to pay down or to eliminate student debt uh, associated with the pandemic, or maybe, maybe it wasn't associated with the pandemic. So I'm, I didn't know if this was a question for Patricia or a question for you, so I'm gonna ask it at the end. Um, do we have a significant number of students or over average number of students who are now in debt as a result of the pandemic? And is that one of the things that you're considering? Great question. Yes, uh, over the last uh, three terms, we did pull a list and that list was 628 students they averaged less than $1,000 each of debt. We did outreach to them via email, text, uh, constant contact. And out of that, 100, uh, we, uh, 106 re-enrolled and they opted for the her funds to be applied to their debt and they did enroll. And so that roughly was like 17% of, and we are still going back and we are, are going to be as a team mm -hmm. reevaluating that debt again and doing more analysis. So I think if that becomes an obstacle for students to come back, that that could potentially, whether it's lost revenue or student assistant fund, could be a way that we can encourage them to come back and enroll. So I just, I thought that was an innovative idea when I, I heard about it. And I encourage any of you, if you hear something like that, text it or send a, a link to Dr. Eskimi and there, there's, there's no shortage of examples and good ideas. We'll probably hear a lot of them uh, for those of us who are going to San Diego for the ACCT conference. We'll probably hear some good ideas there as well. Yes, please pass those along. And that was on my long list of, of <laughs> ideas that I sent to <laughs> Dr. Escamilla. Any other questions? Any comments? Yes, sir. And again, just thinking about future utilization of some of the money that we're investing related to IT and the services that we're doing for, I want to say off-site learning or um, remote learning. Lenore, are there, are there any possibilities or opportunities to be able to look at some of those programs that we have, like the meal rights group or the process technology? I mean, some of the stuff that's really, I mean, in front of a lot of institutions and just getting back to one of the comments that Dr. Dama said about how we've we've led, we've been leading the charge, and I think in the workplace or the workforce development, that's an area in our Windward campus, that's an area where I think we're excelling in. Are there, you think there's some opportunities to be able to 
dial up or dial into some expertise that might be not located in Corpus Christi that might be able to help those groups because we don't have That's local talent. Yes, yeah. that is. And this technology that we're buying now, that will allow us to do that. It allows us to engage. Uh, for example, all the content, the lecture content for process technology, a lot of your industrial programs, your health programs are already put online. But with this technology, they'd be able to enhance simulations and then connect to like an expert that's anywhere in the country to, okay. to uh, enhance those courses. Okay, great, thank you. Regent Garza, Garza um, just yesterday, uh, Dr. Halcom and I were talking about an emerging program that we currently have on a uh, skills, oh, I forget the term, the short skills. Oh, it's a, uh, yes. Occupational Skills Award. Uh, yeah, Skills Award, yeah, at, uh, in artificial intelligence. And, and, uh, and we were bringing that up because of kind of the same line of thinking, you know, what are the opportunities for this whole new area in, in an associated work, workforce program? It's in the computer science, computer programming. I don't even know how to describe it because uh, I told, admittedly, I told uh, uh, Dr. Halkin that I know just enough to ask the question. I was reading an article on, on artificial intelligence and its emergence and so forth. So just know that we, uh, the faculty, and when I asked the question, she reminded me, actually, I don't ever knew that I really knew that we were already teaching this, this skills award in a very small component. And that can easily be nurtured and grown uh, here at the college. So um, we are watching emerging opportunities, not only to augment the, the programs that we have, but totally new fields as well such as uh, artificial intelligence. Any other questions or comments? Thank you all very much. Very comprehensive report. We appreciate it very much. Next, we will have our <laughs> enrollment update. Uh, Ms. Keyes and uh, Ms. Benavides Dominguez. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, and this, the HERF report, I think, leads really w very well into the enrollment report because this report is looking at, in many ways, this last academic year. This is our most thorough in report on enrollment, and it's a capturing what's happened over the last year, which was directly impacted by COVID. And I think when we go through some of the numbers, you're going to see where the HER funds will impact and have impacted enrollment. And that's all very good. Okay, uh, as we review enrollment in the past academic year, the impact of the state biennium, base year calculation for contact hours, formula funding, the head count, and contact hours for credit courses, dual credit, continuing education contact hours will all be explored. The Texas legislature funds community colleges on a base year that calculates contact hours that are earned during the even-numbered years. That determines the state reimbursement or funding for the next two academic years. The base year begins in summer one semester and continues through the end of the following spring semester. The number of contact hours is based on the number of hours of instruction each student takes within each course. This includes credit, in most continuing education courses. I'd like to comment, most people think that we are paid based on credit hour. We're really paid on contact hour. Okay. This is an example of a base year calendar. If you notice the blue line starts, our last base year started in spring of 2020. Spring flex entry was anything beginning in February which calculated really is summer one by definition, through summer two, fall, and spring. And so our base year ended for credit hours in May of 21. If you notice, the green line is for continuing education. Continuing education is paid for contact hour reimbursement also, and it begins in the quarter system beginning in March of last 20. And if you notice, that's about right when we were in the middle of COVID and it runs through February of 21. So both are different, and quite often when you ask for what is enrollment, it's because it depends on where we are within the calendar. I'd like to first point out that there is an error on this slide where we show the $107 million that should have been 
$110,924,000 for let this year's budget. Okay. Our, ba our base year funding for this budget year is represented in the pie chart and shows the state appropriations at 15.6% and state benefits is an additional 5.3% of total funding. These funds are based on the enrollment from February of 2020 through May of 21 for the base year. So the funds we are receiving in this year's budget were basically earned last year. The college will receive for the biennium, or each year for the next two years, beginning in the fall of 21 and the fall of 2022, a total of over $17 million in state reimbursement. Delmar College stands out among other colleges across the state with over $1.7 million coming in contact hours earned from continuing education. This shows an increase of over 36% in funding for continuing education. The combination of increased funding in continuing education contact hours and student success formula, the gold, the gold, bottom, uh, gold channel at the bottom, provide an overall increase for two years for state funding. So this is very dramatic as we move forward and you look at and we understand the different component parts that come together to really create our state reimbursement. This next slide provides an overview as to how we compare to the large college cohort. And I always like to almost disqualify Blinn when you recognize it's such a different, different college. Each column varies depending upon the contact hours for the best year and subsequent funding for the college. Del Mar is third, and that's including Blinn, for the total state funding However, it's significant to point out the impressive funding for continuing education compared to other colleges. That's that one point, almost $1.8 million. This increase is due in large part, I want to give credit, to Dr. Leonard Rivera, Dean of Continuing Education and Off-Campus Programs, and Dan Corris, who's Dean of Workforce Development and Corporate Services, and their staffs. During COVID, they were able to continue and expand continuing education in a variety of areas, such as uh, commercial, uh, CDL, commercial truck driving, and a lot of allied health programs. This almost $1.8 million in funds is one of the highest amounts in the state, if not second or third highest in the state, and during the challenging COVID-19 times. The, in addition to contact our funding, that is reimbursed based on the defined rate per hour, which is shown here with the $5.83. The state allocates funds among all colleges by student success points. Ms. Benavides Dominguez will explain the criteria for student success points in just a minute. Core operations is a set amount across the bottom that the state funds each year and is set at the same for all colleges However, it does vary from in a few instances for this last year. In summary, this shows the trend for the base year contact hours for credit and continuing education courses since 2014. The percent change for credit hour contact hours for this next biennium as compared to 2020 for credit hours is down 7% as whereas continuing education is up 29%, resulting in an overall decrease for the college of 4.1%. However, it is good to note that prior to the impact of the, of the pandemic, this was trend was trending up. And now Mrs. Benavides Dominguez, or Patricia, will provide additional information on student success points and enrollment for this last fall. Patricia. Thank you, Lenore. Thank you. This graph, the student success funding, this graph is a review of how colleges receive uh, student success points. Texas Community College receives points after a student reaches certain milestones, such as completing developmental work, completing 15, 30 hours, and earning a credential. 
the annual weighted success points total, this chart compares DMC to the other large colleges in our peer group. It shows where we are in regard to success points. During 2019-2020, the, the success points total for Del Mar was 16,753, which is flat compared to 2018-2019 and down 5% from 2017-2018. The spring credit headcount. This slide is our state reported data for spring credit headcount and includes flex entry data. This slide is a good indication of the strategic shift that the college took during the pandemic. The focus on increasing second eight weeks added 2,880 flex students to our CBM count. This gave the college a slight 5.8% boost from the overall headcount from spring 2020. Fall credit headcount. Please note uh, that the last column has been updated and I'm going to read you that last column. Uh, the slide in this review, our headcount for fall 2021, the certification process is ongoing. Thus far, our current count is 10,681 and we are down 2.3 percent from fall 2020. Do you have any questions? Let me just add to that sure. if I may. Um, again, you moved really quickly through the point, uh, Patricia, that, that we're still enrolling for the fall. Yes. We've loaded up on eight-week sessions. Are you going to get into that here in just a little bit? I need to be quiet right now and let you do your presentation, don't I? Okay. One thing, I'll let you go on. <laughs> I apologize. One, one thing, though, that I'd like to, that I'd like to add is the, with, with regard to the student success um, points, you know, there's a loss there, and there's many losses across the, na across the state, and really it's called the learning loss that's occurred. There's an actual, and you, and for those who have been hearing about that learning loss uh, through COVID, is the actual amount of learning that's ta that taking place. That's how, that's one of the ways that it's quantified through, a fi through, our fi through our financial model that we have. But there's an actual loss of learning that's going on around the world um, and being that, that, that the COVID impact is, is, is having, is reaping havoc over. And that is it, our students are, are getting, or they're making lower grades, they're, they're attaining less. Therefore, they're not uh, hitting the success points uh, along the way, along that spectrum, um, as much as they have in the past because of all the hindrances and all the tragedies and all the things that they're, they're employing. There's many articles about that. I've read many. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start piling them up. I'm going to share them with you all because that learning loss is a real thing. Thank you, Patricia. No problem. Uh, to add to what Dr. Escamilla said, <clears throat> yes, the committee, the the HERF committee, and as well as uh, in outreach and enrollment services and retention services, we are focusing on uh, second eight weeks and recruitment of. Uh, we have already been uh, doing some more awards. Uh, for We looked at students that uh, still have not paid their second eight weeks courses. We're outreaching to those students. We're also working with our embedded advisors and looking at see how, who else can we access formerly enrolled, currently enrolled, to see if they can add any other classes. And also, November 1 opens up the spring registration, and we are also working with uh, recruitment for spring 22. And working with Jonda, because Jonda's uh, my comrade in uh, increasing uh, faculty and student courses that we can offer for students. Summer one credit headcount. This slide is a review of our headcount for summer one 2020. We certified 4,532, which we were up 7% from summer 2020. The flex enrollment assisted in the overall certified data. And that was also strategic with planning with our instruction. Summer two credit headcount. This slide is a review of our headcount for summer 2, 2021. We certified 3737, uh, which we are down 9% from summer 
2020. But still, flex was pretty good there. Our next slide is uh, credit contact hours. Please note that the last column uh, was recently updated. The chart provides a historical perspective of our contact hours. The chart illustrates a steady increase in contact hours for the last five years for both fall and spring. The impact of COVID is evident in fall 2020. But as you can see, fall 21 contact hours are trending up. This one year change went up 4.5%. Any questions on that? Sure. I think it, it's significant to point out that contact hours are up for fall, but enrollment by headcount is down. And that's the impact of the HERF. Yes. And that through their team, they've gone in and worked with students and said, we'll pay for your next course. We will pay off if you owe. They went through financial aid and identified students who had paid that maybe had a small balance left of a few hundred dollars and they awarded those monies. And so they, they captured students and got them to take additional courses, which increased the contact hours. This is very significant. And that is the impact of HERF in bringing those contact hours up, even though the head count is, is down. Did, did I have a question. Sure. Well, but why is the head count down so much? We really think because of the dry, when we started classes was the highest point of the, of the Delta V variant. Remember that was really high within our community and we felt like it directly impacted. One of the things that uh, Patricia just showed was that summer one was much higher enrollment for this summer compared to last summer. So we were trending up until the Delta variant kicked in. Yep. There was, yeah, there was a point where we were 700 students above where we were expecting coming into, coming into the fall enrollment. And we were thinking, wow, there's, there's, a, there's a little margin right there that it's gonna be very useful. The, the spike in the enrollment, uh, the spike in the Delta variant just threw everyone for a loop. Everybody was thinking, when I say everybody, I'm talking about the other 49 colleges as we were, as we were all talking at the state level, we were thinking some relief is coming. But the, the, the in, where the inordinate spikes were hitting across the state, um, it, it shut everybody down. It shut everybody, I mean, it shut students down, it shut whole families down. And so um, where the indicators were, where we always use summer as an indicator, you, know, you, you come out of summer and then you have a, this thing called the Delta variant, you, you, you just, it, it's, you go to the unexpected very quickly. Well, we're looking at um, the summer two credit, that's credit head count. Um, and in the summer of 2020, we're at 4105. So that would have been the height of the first, pan, first wave of the pandemic, right? And then um, summer 2021, we're still down from, from that year, and I, it seemed to me there was more panic in the summer of 20 than there, there was in 21. Look at summer one. We were trending up for summer one, which is basically June, and then when we hit the middle of July, as it started trending up, our family started getting out, and summer two was light. But overall, we were trending up pretty significantly in summer one of 21. And so we oh, were looking at yeah. that. Okay, so that's what you're talking yeah. about. Yes. We, we were getting what we expected in the first session of uh, summer, and then the Delta variant just shut it down. That's right. That's, what we, that's okay. what we project. Okay. So, just, right. just a side yes. note, and, and this all, uh, you know, going into the fall semester, and let me tie it back to another presentation when we were you know, trying to put this, this vaccination incentive program together is why we were moving so fast on that one too. It's a related thing, but all of those things, those are all the balls we're juggling, you know, to just, to just keep us as safe as possible and, and, and keep the enrollment with that, uh, you know, at, at, at the highest level possible. I, my hat's off to the team who never left. 
Um, they deserve, our team deserves that the, you know, the faculty and staff that all came together and never left and, and, and rode that very, very difficult set of circumstances and led through all that was just amazing. So I just have to thank them um, in front of the board and in front of everybody for, for, for staying there with our students at a very difficult time. Moving on to our dual credit head count. Please note that uh, this slide also, uh, the last column it has changed. Uh, the dual credit program continues to grow. However, from fall 20 to fall 21, enrollment did take a slight dip. Overall, this slide shows that there has been a five-year increase of 12%. We currently, we currently have 36 high schools participating in the dual credit program, and our dual credit office is awesome. I want to thank them. Uh, it is due to the great relationships they have built in the local ISDs, and we are confident that enrollment will continue to thrive. I do want to make a comment uh, regarding this dip in dual credit in that uh, I asked uh, our staff and we recently had a, um, a counselor expo in where we had near 60 people from uh, counselors from around the coastal bend participate virtually and we asked them like what, what was the dip in enrollment uh, because our enrollment number right now is at uh, 2447 for, uh, for fall for dual credit. And they stated the reason that last year during the, um, during the pandemic that they shifted to remote learning. And then they were in college classes remote learning. And so it was just too much. And so then coming in, we had the Delta variant in the summer and they just kind of backed off. But they anticipate that the spring they will come back up, but it was just overall a lot for them to handle and parents wanted uh, to, to, to pull back a little bit. Uh, we currently uh, have, uh, you know, I think fabulous participation for our, for our uh, dual credit uh, advisors, contacts, uh, our, our schools, we are in dialogue with them. Another important factor for y'all to know is that last year our dual credit uh, coordinators and director got to go into the classrooms and visit with students, but our out outreach and enrollment center could not because the ISDs were limiting who was coming into the to the schools. But this year, I'm happy to report that our staff, all our staff, is welcomed and and coming back into the schools and meeting with students, doing apply Texas, helping them with the. FAFSA, now that FAFSA has opened up for October. So that's, that's welcome news this, this year. Uh -huh. uh, the next slide, total uh, contact hours for credit and continuing ed. This slide provides contact uh, hour data for, from 2014 to the current base year 2021. As you can see, credit hours are down, but continuing ed hours are trending up. The CE data is preliminary as quarter four is still not certified. Do you want to say anything? On this slide, this is our last slide, uh, fall headcount uh, from our large peer group. As you can see, uh, this, this compares us to our other peers around the state. Uh, it shows that we fall somewhere in the middle with a decrease of 2.6 in headcount. And really, is, are there any more questions for Patricia or I? I just want to thank you. This is a great deep dive, um, and, and we have all been concerned about these numbers. We're concerned about what's happening with our students, and can we, can we get them back in the door? Can we keep, keep them on track? Um, so what I'm hearing is, is a lot of flexibility, a lot, you're, you're trying a lot of different tactics, but I think the, the overall strategy is, is good and, and we will be here when our students are ready for us. So but kudos to you. Are any questions, any other questions, comments? Quick comment, Madam Chair. Again, what we talked about and we only touched on is looking for spring. Uh, Patricia and Lenora both talked about spring coming up and in what 
the nation is getting ready for, and certainly the state of Texas, is that fall was going to be this bumpy ride. I use terms of squishy and all these other kinds of things to describe enrollment. It's, it's, it's going to be a bumpy ride. We're still enrolling for the second eight weeks in fall and so forth. We're already talking about and already prepping courseware and everything else, getting everything ready for spring enrollment. Spring is going to be uh, a time where if it happens here, if there's not a, another spike or anything like that, God forbid all that, um, th that um, spring is when, they're, when, when people will be popping their heads up more readily and uh, in, in, in greater numbers. And so we're getting ready for spring. Um, it's a, uh, what's unusual about Del Mar that I've noticed uh, over the years is how spring became the bigger semester um, and bigger than fall. That was historically almost unheard of, and only until like 2010, 11, 12, if I'm not mistaken, back in that era, spring started becoming the big semester for whatever reason. If we tie that into, it, so if those are indicators, if those are indicators, and we believe they are, um, and if there's no, not another spike uh, in any kind of, uh, with, with, the, with, the, with the virus and so forth, um, we expect uh, the latter part of fall and spring to, um, to, be, for, to be a very robust enrollment for our college. So thank you for that. Thank you. Well, thank I know, you very much. I, I know you all look at this. We've, we've had this conversation at the table before about our being off cycle with unemployment and that when when jobs are scarce um, that uh, people come back to school when when there are job opportunities aplenty people go get the jobs so I'm, I'm I think we're gonna while I hear you I think we also need to understand that, that these last two academic years have been unlike anything Absolutely. so keep keep your flexible dancing shoes on because I think there's going to continue to need to be a, a lot of adjustment and, and because we, we it's so hard to predict what what students are going to do at all levels. Yes, ma'am. All right. Thank, thank you. you both. Thank you all. Uh, this is the Patricia Benavides Dominguez month. You're just... <laughs> <laughs> Hope you're wearing comfortable shoes. Uh, yes. Next, we're going to hear about our TRIO grant. <laughs> yes. So, like, I'm very, very excited about the, these next two slides that I'm going to talk to you about. But on uh, Tuesday, September 28th, uh, I was notified that we were funded for our first ever TRIO EOC Yay. grant. We are so honored and look forward to the opportunity to uh, positively impacting the lives of people in our community. And let me tell you a little bit about TRIO EOC. Uh, the TRIO EOC, I would call it EOC, uh, Educational Opportunity Center, is a federally funded program through the U.S. Department of Education dedicated to helping individuals begin or resume their journey toward their educational goals, vocational, technical, college, or university. The OC program will provide guidance, counseling, uh, career guidance, tutoring, mentoring, financial aid advising, college admissions assistance, testing workshops, coordinate with other higher ed institutions for transfer opportunities. We are funded to serve 850 students per year, and the five-year grant uh, is funded at 232,000 with a total award of 1.1 million 250. I know I said that wrong, but 1.1 million. Um, <clears throat> the, 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 this slide defines the DOE requirements under the TRIO EOC. We have already been in contact with DOE on setting up budget and are in the process of hiring staff to execute the grant. But those are the requirements for being, to participate in EOC. You have to be 19 years of age of older, U.S. citizen, national permanent resident, or eligible non-citizen, resident of Nueces, Refugio, and San Patricio counties. That was very important to us when we were writing this grant. Uh, does not have to have a four-year degree, express desired interest to enroll uh, in an adult education program or program of post-secondary education, show academic need, and meet 
two or more eligibility requirements, low income, uh, defined by uh, TRIO, uh, first uh, gen in college, documented disability, and or a veteran. And I'd also like to thank uh, Dr. Escamilla for allowing uh, me to pursue this grant and give, uh, give me a help to do that because I was pretty bummed when I missed it by 2.5 points initially. Yes. I, this is so fun. These, these are the fun parts of, of, these, of this type of work. When Patricia and, and, and Dr. Silva at mm -hmm. the time came to me, they said, hey, there's this TRIO grant out there, Mark. What are you thinking? It's a long, sh long shot, this and that. I'm like, the long shot, that's the story of my life. Bring it. Let's go. Let's, let's, let's do it. And we have an amazing consultant, Mr. Trujillo, who helps us with our Title V uh, federal other well not just title five but f federal grants he is absolutely a superstar does things for the college gives us exceptional rates all kinds of things and we trust him implicitly he said it's going to be a long shot well i said let's go we trust you he says you'll have two one maybe two bites at the apple the first one we missed as patricia was saying and when she called me and she says, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I'm like, Patricia, we did our best. It was a long shot. We did our best. Tell Mr. Trujillo, well, I'll get back with him. We'll, it's okay. And then she says, well, there's some, there's some other little possibilities where there's a second round, kind of, a, kind of a, a wild card round. And then she called me back last week, Wednesday. Tuesday. 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 You. Yeah, mm -hmm. you texted me and then I called you and... She says, we got the grant, we got the grant, we got it in the wild card round, I called it, and boom, there it is, the long shot story. Well, it's because of the diligence um, with, of the team and, and, and how they persevered and, and, and believed in, 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 in themselves and in this college. That's what you get. That, those are the kinds of untold stories all too often, all too often that are, that are taking place here at that college, and, and uh, I told her, let's get that thing on the agenda as fast as we can, because... Well, let's, let's share it while the news is hot. And I look forward to uh, continuing to build TRIO because this will be the third TRIO grant that Delmar has, and I think that is a testament to the leadership here and all the colleagues here that we all work together. Congratulations. Thanks for sharing that with us. Great job. Uh, last on our staff reports for the day is our annual security and safety report. Uh, Ms. McDonald. Thank you. For this staff report, our interim chief of police, Lauren White, will be providing the board with a summary of the requirements of the annual security and safety report along with the review. Prior to the meeting, um, each regent was given a copy of the report. This is what it looks like. It should have been at your, pl your placing. Mm -hmm. And that will be for your reference and review. I also want to thank Chief White for leading this effort. Lauren? Good afternoon, board. Madam Chair, Dr. Escamilla, um, we're pretty, we are pleased to present you with the 2021 Annual Security and Safety Report. I would like to take a moment to thank the committee, which you will find on page four of the booklet, and a special thank you to Ralph Goonan and Rosalinda Reynosa of College Relations, who helped to proofread it and get it to the printer for us. Just a reminder that this says 2021, but the information in it is from 19 or from 2020. Um, the Jean Cleary Disclosure of Campus Security Policy and Campus Crime Statistics Act, or the Cleary Act, is a federal mandate requiring all institutions of higher education that participate in the federal student financial aid program to disclose information about crime on their campuses and in the surrounding communities. The Department of Education also requires that we provide information on Title IX and Violence Against Women, or VAWA Act, along with our drug policies and a few other policies that are mentioned um, in the report. All updated policies and programs are included along with the crime stats for the required three-year period, which is 2018 through 2020, and are on pages 19 through 23. These stats include crimes that occur on our campus or in the surrounding reporting area, but does not necessarily reflect crimes committed by or upon our students. We did comply with the published date of October 1st, 2021. Digitally, it is available on our website 
and then you have the printed copy in front of you. You have any questions? Any questions for Chief White? Any questions? Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Regents, we'll move on to our pending business report. Um, upcoming in November, we have our board retreat and follow up on the uh, appraisal district appointment for Nueces County. Uh, in December, we will have a workshop, including uh, our key performance indicators around uh, student enrollment and also be talking about our strategic enrollment management plan, uh, foundation report, and discuss our tuition policy uh, that gives the staff an early indication of what we might be willing to do on tuition, which gets set at our uh, February meeting. At this point, I'll point out to you again that we are not anticipating a January meeting, so we'll get to give staff and all of us a, uh, a New Year's present and have January off. Any questions about our pending item list? Moving on to our consent agenda. Uh, board members, we have uh, items on the consent agenda, approval of minutes and acceptance of investment reports, items one and two. Does anything need to be pulled for separate consideration? Seeing none, is there a motion to adopt our consent agenda as presented? Thank you, Ms. Hutchison. Is there a second? Second. Second by Dr. Villarreal. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed, same sign. That motion passes. Uh, we will start our action report with a discussion and action related to our 2020-2021 internal audit report. Ms. McDonald. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. This afternoon, I have Daniel Graves and I believe Brandon. Brandon Tanos is here with uh, Weaver and they will be presenting the fiscal year 21 annual internal audit report and they will also provide a status with our fiscal year 22 internal audit plan yeah Brandon. dan it's great to see you in person yes thank you very much it's gl glad to be back here in person and get to see everybody face to face instead of on little screens that's right uh, this time so i really appreciate you guys having uh, brandon and i here uh brandon I do pull down your there you go. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> so. I do have, um, first off, uh, congratulations to you, Ms. Scott, and to Dr. Escamilla on your appointment to the, the Finance Commission. That's, that's really big for the college. Uh, we were pleased to see that when it came up. So um, that's exciting. Uh, I do have a status for you uh, for where we're at with the current internal audit plan. Uh, just two quick things, the annual internal audit report and an update on the 2022 internal audit risk assessment. Uh, the annual internal audit report, I believe you have a copy of. It is a prescribed report that we file uh, on behalf of the college. It does go to the state auditor's office, the governor's office, and the legislative budget board. It has a very prescriptive format, so we don't really get to choose what goes in there. We just report on the content that the SAO asks for. Uh, you'll see there uh, on the slide and in your, your report, there's seven specific sections. Uh, there's a compliance statement that we will post the annual report and the audit results of the audit plan and the 2022 audit plan on the college website uh, within 30 days of your approval or by November 1st, whichever uh, comes first. Uh, it does present the results of the internal audit plan for this fiscal year. Uh, it's a disclosure of any uh, consulting services that we may have provided to the college. Uh, it talks about, uh, has a section in there that gives you uh, and, and discloses the quality assurance review of us. And so in that, we've included our peer review letter from 2019, just so you're aware. Uh, every three years, uh, public accounting firms have a uh, peer review, and so that's our most recent. We're up for peer review again next year. Uh, it does include a disclosure for the 2022 internal audit plan as well as a disclosure on the external audit services provided to the college or, or who the college is contracted with for those. And then a section on disclosing or uh, how the college handles and reports fraud, waste, and abuse. So the, the one caveat I have for you this year in the, this report is in the 2022 plan, we don't have a 2022 plan yet. And the reason for that is, is because it, it is time for us to refresh the risk assessment. When we first started with the college, we did a wholesale, um, very in-depth risk assessment process where we have a facilitated self-assessment. Uh, we sit down with 
the president, his cabinet members, and go at very in-depth and talk about risks and significant operations and processes here at the college. And we risk rate all of those. We develop a risk rated universe and then we apply historical audit and other uh, audits that are either performed and reported externally or performed by others and build a multi-year plan. Well, we finished our multi-year plan uh, with all the follow-ups that we did this year and it's time to do a wholesale uh, refresh and develop a new one. And you'll see that we have that scheduled uh, for October 21st. So later this month, we will be sitting down with management. We're in the planning process now to, to refresh all our documents and we will be developing a, a new snapshot of risk at the college and then have a three year audit plan that will be developed and presented to the audit committee uh, now that we have an, an audit committee that is, is getting up and running, uh, we'll have a lot more in-depth conversation with them, I'm sure, and then we will present that to the board for approval, and then we can get started on the 2022 plan. So when that's developed, we have to send that to the LBB, the governor's office, uh, just like the other report, get it posted up on the website. But until then, we've disclosed in there that we are, are in the process of developing that plan, and so that's what the, the only caveat for the, the annual internal audit report uh, this year. So with that, that's pretty much both, both things in tandem because they all combine into that one report uh, and we'll open for any questions that you might have. Regent Benham. Yes, ma'am. Um, we now have an audit committee, so I'm wondering how we're gonna coordinate that, coordinate the 2022 plan with the audit committee and what's the, log the logistics of that? So the logistics is we're gonna go through our our risk assessment process uh, by working with the college leadership, us facilitating, conducting the risk assessment. We're going to prepare a proposed three-year plan and then we'll present that to the audit committee, uh, get feedback and have interaction and conversation at that point. And so that's the, the coordination and logistics for, for that part of the process. And what's the timing of that? Uh, with the 21st, uh, being the risk assessment date, it'll take us probably about a week to go through, compile results, do some analysis, uh, develop the plan, and, and come back to uh, Dr. Escamilla and his team to, to do that, and then after that. So we would be ready probably, it might be a push to be able to have the materials to the audit committee before the November meeting, but we could we could try to do that. If, if I'm, we one, I'm wondering, we, we have to have another meeting anyway. <laughs> So, so we probably should coordinate that. So November or, or December, I'm happy to, um, we can talk about uh, you know, through, through Tammy, coordinate that with the audit committee and the timing of when we'll be ready to present that with uh, Mr. Garza or you, whomever, whomever we need to coordinate with at that time. Does it need to come back to the board for approval? Is there a approval process for the risk assessment or the plan has to be approved the based on the risk assessment? The plan is what would need to be approved. Okay, that's probably assessment. unrealistic to do all of that prior to the November meeting. That, that's what I was a little concerned of. Definitely by December we would be able to. Uh, right. But November might be a little bit of a rush. Right, so if we had an audit committee at some point in November in preparation in November probably yeah in preparation for the December board meeting so that the audit committee can look at it prior to it coming for action to the board yeah. so we would see that we would see the results of the risk assessment and the draft plan for 22 yes and it'll be a multi-year plan we'll put together another package multi-year plan just like we did at first so right. we structure the audits in a way that we can leverage one from one year off the next uh, or uh, like we've done in the past with IT, we, we really stagger and structure those um, so that we build a, a knowledge base and learning as we go through and can leverage those. So we'll, we'll have a three-year plan. The, the biggest part is the 2022 plan, obviously, to get approved and get moving on for, for that fiscal year. Very good. Does that satisfy your question? Yes. Any other questions for Dan? You're here in person, and that's the shortest presentation I know, you've made. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> you've made two in a year. <laughs> <laughs> but it's necessary and important, so I'm glad that I could be here to do that face-to-face. Uh, -face. Yes, sir, Mr. Garza. Well, I'll be around and available, so we're not... 
So we'll work with uh, Dr. Escamilla and Ms. McDonald to get that scheduled. Ms. McDonald is one of our staff liaisons for that committee, so we'll right. work on getting that scheduled appropriately. Good. Good point. All right. So Anything I do think, else? I do think... Uh, oh, we need formal action. That is correct. Do, do we, we do. We need action for the, the report so that we can get it posted to the website. Absolutely. Yes. So uh, there is a recommendation from staff that the uh, board accept the fiscal year 2021 annual internal audit report. Is there such a motion? Thank you, Mr. Garza. Second by Mr. Bennett. Any discussion on that motion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Same sign. That motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much for having us today. Thank you. Okay, uh, the college's quarterly investment report. Mr. Garcia. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, today we have uh, Mr. David McElwain from Patterson and Associates who will discuss the college's investment yields, investment performance, and strategies in pursuit of higher yields. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello, hello. Obviously, um, we are in the midst of trying to recover post-pandemic. Um, all the economic, um, I guess, all the uh, slowdown of economic activity due to sheltering in place. So, right now, we've got you know the Federal Reserve outlook. Uh, and we're talking about through 2022. Uh, we're seeing economic activity again start to pick back up. Employment is improving. And the, I think one of the biggest concerns right now is inflation. We're starting to see inflation is rising. Um, there are a lot of transit, you know, transitory factors related to COVID that are, are driving it higher than normal. Um, the Fed's goal is still to try to aim to achieve inflation moderately above that 2% mark. And uh, we expect the Fed is going to continue to maintain accommodative policies um, until, you know, we get the economy where we can, we can start to surpass the pre-COVID economic conditions. Let's see here. I thought this might be a little easier. Uh, the next chart is just taking a look at the labor force participation rate. Um, right now, we're seeing the uh, most of the recovery is being fueled by those between the ages of 25 and 54. Um, the uh, participation rate for um, the well, that particular um, 24 to 54, the ages 24, 25 to 54, that particular segment traces over to the left. It's at 81.7 percent. Um, the entire labor force participation rate has remained relatively flat. Um, that's that uh, yellow line over to the right side, just below 62%. And believe it or not, the percentage of the U.S. population that's retiring is now approaching 20%. Is there a better way to do this? <laughs> okay. Um, the non-farm payrolls, right now, again, we're talking about, we're trying to get job creation. Um, it's starting to come back. Uh, you see the dash lines there represent, there's still a little deficit to get back to the pre-COVID levels. Um, the July unemployment rate most recently showed a decrease down to 5.4%. Uh, total non-farm payroll employment rose by 943,000 in the month of July. And then the three-month average increase of non-farm payroll employment stands at 832,000. So we're just, again, gonna hit a few more economic points before we get into y'all's numbers. Um, the contributions to inflation. Right here, you'll see the things that uh, are deemed to be COVID-related. Inflation is represented by the red and you'll see that at the far right. Um, you see it spiking up there a little bit in the, in the past couple of uh, months. You, um, you take, strip that out, and the core CPI is uh, rising, you know, ever so slightly, or a 
is what we're being told is, you know, just moderately. Um, right now, those sensitive items that we're talking about, uh, used cars um, are commanding high prices, car rentals, air, you know, airline fares, uh, a lot of uh, personal computers, TVs and toys. There's a major chip shortage going on as a result of um, a, probably a combination of lack of ability to get enough people into the foundries to start cranking the chips back out again. You keep hearing that when they talk about new car production. There's so many more chips going into new car production and there's too few chips to go around to keep up with the, the demand at the moment. So, I mean, overall, it's kind of mixed. I mean, there is demand out there, um, but we do have some bottlenecks that are starting to uh, arise. And then obviously, uh, historical yields remain extremely low um, relative um, to uh, what we've been accustomed to over the past couple of decades. Um, the local government in investment pool rates, the LGIP rates, remain extremely low, and that's just relative to Fed policy. Right now, Fed funds rate, um, most of y'all who uh, keep up with Fed funds policy saw that we had two emergency rate cuts. Uh, in March of last year, the Fed funds rate was at a 1.75 percent. The Fed cut aggressively by 100, and, and another uh, Fed cut by 50 to bring us down to that zero to a quarter range, right? And that's where we've been staying. Um, you're starting to see Treasury yields creep up a little bit in response to the most recent meeting where they're going to maybe taper some of their purchases that are supporting um, a, a lot of the the bonds in the marketplace. And on to the actual portfolio, we tab down. It's just, uh, there we go. All right. Uh, so the current portfolio, this is a snapshot of as of your fiscal year end, August 31st. Um, we had a pretty good amount in those pools, um, those local government investment pools. That is represented by your cash at 56 million. Um, overall, that portion of the portfolio is almost 30%. Your securities portion was 135 million, and that's split up over the you know, government agencies, a little bit, uh, about 22% in commercial paper, and municipal bonds was approximately 30% of the portfolio. One of the interesting things, if y'all really you know, dig into the reports on a granular level, pre-COVID, we had very little municipal bond exposure. When the markets kind of went to hell in a handbasket and rates temporarily spiked up in municipal bonds, it was a panic selling. We took advantage of a lot of that in y'all's portfolio, and we're continuing to see spreads over treasuries that make us want to continue to you know, be heavy in municipal bonds. And right now, the average uh, yield of the portfolio is 0.35. If you look at the division of the various portfolios, about 35% of all the assets are in the local maintenance account, which is like your general fund, obviously. Um, you've got 21% of the portfolio is the 2020 bonds, and 19% uh, is still in the 2018 construction funds. Um, but actually, you've got a combination of just over 22% in the 18, and a combination of about 34% and the 2020 construction. The rest is plant and INS. Um, the pooled funds, excluding the construction funds, if we look at the far left column is the fiscal year average. The column just to the right of it is specifically the fourth quarter. And you can see that the uh, book and market value are roughly 85 million. Again, this is gonna be tied to kind of the local maintenance and plant funds. The weighted average maturity of those is um, less than uh, 180 days, and the yield there is 0.27 compared to the six-month T-bill has been around a 0.05. A one, just one-year uh, treasury right now today is about a 0 0.07, 0 0.08, very, very low. And um, the total earnings here in the most recent quarter was just over 74,000, and, and the average over the fiscal year um, come out to a little over 400,000. Go ahead. This one? Okay. Perfect. The asset allocation of this pooled fund group, uh, again, 
you'll see just a tab down just a little bit. We're comparing the previous quarter that ended May 31st to August 31st. Um, you can see specifically uh, the pie chart to the right is where we finished up the fiscal year end. We had uh, about 34% of the pool funds were in municipal bonds. 38% was in cash, liquid cash, um, in the pools. You had uh, about 25% in short-term commercial paper and um, just a very smaller, very small amount in the, in the sweep at the bank. Um, the yield from commercial paper continues to go down. The average yield um, at the end of August was 0.25. Now uh, new investment is going to be sub 20. So like new nine month uh, commercial paper is about 0 0.17, 0 0.18 is about as good as it gets at the moment. Um, again, the sweet spot is municipal bond market. Um, we found a lot of short term opportunities in bans issued by other municipalities around the country and TANs. And then we've complemented that with some longer term paper. Um, where right now there's a, a very big divide between the one-year yield and the three-year yield. One-year treasury, I said 0 0.07, 0 0.08. Uh, three-year treasury yield right now is a 0.52, and a two-year is right in between at about a 0.29. This is uh, specifically the 2018 bonds that uh, it, you know remain in the portfolio. Um, at the end of fourth quarter, it was just over 41, just uh, almost 41 and a half million. The yield on that portfolio is a uh, respectable 0.58, relative again to a, a six month treasury is about a 0.05 and a one year is 0.09. Um, the earnings off of those construction funds are pretty robust. Um, they came in at 62,000 in the most recent quarter and they earned a little over 314,000 for the fiscal year. And then the 2020 bonds, um, there remain about 65 and a half million as of August 31st uh, in those funds. And the average yield there was a 0.3, um, which would, again was more than triple a one year treasury yield um, and uh, about six times a six month T-bill. The uh, earnings off of that portfolio um, again, coming in at just under 300000 for the year. And then when we combine the asset allocation of all the construction funds there, that's what that pie chart's showing. Again, we've got about 21% of the construction funds in muni bonds, 22% in liquid pools. That's overnight liquidity for uh, you know immediate needs. Um, we've got 34% in government agency paper and then 23% is structured in a short-term ladder for shorter-term maturities. Um, but again, the CP yields uh, are about 0.27, agency yields are just under 0.4, and municipal yields there average a 0.55. Um, the government pools right now are about a 0.06, but the average for the quarter came out to a 0.08. And that concludes that report. So if you have any questions specifically related to your portfolio, or if I can um, try to answer any questions on the outlooks, feel free. <laughs> Thank you, David. Thank you for being here. Any questions? All right. Thanks so much. We do have a, uh, an action item to accept the college's quarterly investment report. Is there a motion to that effect? Thank you, Dr. Adami. Second? Second by Mr. Garza. Any discussion on that motion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Same sign. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now the monthly, excuse me, the quarterly financial report. Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, so the financial condition of the college for the 12 months ending August 2021 uh, is stable uh, relative to the current pandemic and economic uncertainty. The college is closing the year with the downward revenue pressure valued at 3.6 million that is offset by reduced spending valued at 7.7 .7 million. The college is positioned to close the fiscal year with a surplus valued at 8.9 million pending the annual fiscal year and audit. Collier, Johnson and Woods, uh, our external auditors will deliver the results of the audit at our December 2021 board meeting. The surplus includes 4.1 million in 
operating surplus, 2.6 million in contingency, and the 2.2 million in HERF lost revenues. If there are no questions, I'll transition into the balance sheet. Questions for Mr. Garcia? All right. Okay, thank you. All right. So the college is well positioned to support the mission uh, of, the, uh, of its operations and whether the current business interruptions caused by the pandemic with a cash and investment position of 68.1 million as of August 2021. This cash and investment position is sufficient to pay its obligations as of August valued at 22.8 million dollars. Madam Chair, Mr. President, and members of the board, this concludes my presentation if there's any questions. Any questions? Is there a motion to accept the college's quarterly financial report? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Is there a second? Second. Second by Dr. Turner. Yeah. I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I heard it from that direction <laughs> by Dr. Villarreal. I apologize. <laughs> Any questions on the motion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Same sign. That motion carries. Thank you, Thank sir. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let's hear about some possible change orders on our 2016 Oso Creek campus construction project. We continue to move forward on our Oso Creek project. If you haven't been out there recently, uh, it's, it's cooler to walk through the buildings now. It's cooler weather out there is all. Uh, we've got several different items that uh, are being recommended. We have, uh, well, we've added in the second elevator. There's some additional work that's uh, $37,344. We have miscellaneous electrical changes for no another $41,000. One of the main things that had been value engineered out were the cyber cafes, coffee bars, and we're adding those back in. It's $173,000. There are two of those, one in the main building with the library and one in the culinary arts building. We have uh, a request for information on the lobby feature wall. That's $8,000. We have uh, gas manifolds and how the gas for the science uh, labs have to be manifolded for $35,000. We have added data drops that is almost $100,000. Uh, department chair bench is at $3,000. Condensate drains on the STEM building for $30,000. The uh, display cases, $42,000. We do have a credit of another about $15,000 and uh, the stain mock-up. So the total of these change orders is $454,399.30. And these would be funded from the bond proceeds themselves that we have, uh, while we're making some interest income, you just heard that there's not a lot of interest income out there. And so we have pretty much exhausted that. So it would be funded from the bond proceeds, but we are still within budget on the project. So this is not contingency funds yet? No, it is, is not it? contingency funds. Okay. Question, Mr. Bennett. So <clears throat> I see we're adding things back in that were originally taken out? That is correct, yes, sir. Can you tell us how much they were taken out at as opposed to how much we're adding them in? Um, so we do, we go back through a process in which we look at what was the original budget bid for that particular item. And then we have a delta now for that increase to add it back in. So some of them are not quite the same. So there's a change on some of those. And we go line by line. And we can go back through on these value engineering items. And I can bring the detailed report. Oh, I don't want the detailed report. Okay. But I'm wondering, the, the bid amount, was that the, hundred, the original 121 yeah, million? Yes, sir. So that was like 40% over our budget amount of 87.5 That is million. correct. Yes, sir. OK. Uh, one other little question. What's that $3,000 bench? Um, so in this particular case, um, part of what you saw was our artwork session last month. And so we have, uh, and if you, I don't know if you noticed it, but outside the STEM building, there's a wall that only architects could design uh, no, no, based on its slope. And so by default, when you go inside and start putting in vertical walls, you end up with space that has some very unique characteristics, which ends up being a very unique bench so that that space can be used appropriately. Yes, sir. Any other questions? I think I said it was the department chair bench. Yes. So it's, it's just for the department. Just it, for the department it chair. It is for the department. Well, it's in their office, and uh, okay. I guess if we were in K through 12, you could say it's the principals and the students who weren't so bad gotcha. there. But no, uh, this is about uh, having a warm and environ environment so that the department chair can interact with the faculty, students, and staff and have that kind of educational environment. Seating area in the department in chair's department office. office. Gotcha. Okay. Yes. Any other questions? Is there a motion to adopt change order number five? So moved. Thank you, Dr. Adami. Is there a second? 
Second by Ms. Averett. Any other questions on that motion? All those in favor, raise your hand. Any opposed, same sign. That motion passes. Uh, now moving on to uh, item number seven, which is discussion of possible action related to a competitive seal proposal for the police station renovation. So you've heard about the, you heard the police report. We've, you have approved the police department, and now we have purchased 3,002 heirs, and we have advertised competitively with a qualifications-based proposal for the renovation of 3,002 heirs to become the new police station. You have the uh, evaluation criteria, you have the evaluation committee, you have the overall scoring, we're recommending the award to Victory Building Team for $2,440,000. They were the top ranked bidder. We did have uh, five bidders who were qualified and you see a big range in pricing on these and this is part of what's going on in the overall construction industry from that uh, low bid, which is what we're recommending, that $2.4 million to a, a top bid of $3.6 million, which is a significant range, which we're seeing in the construction but we are getting a lot of good bids on our projects, and uh, this particular one will be funded with 2014 bond interest income. Are there questions for Mr. Stribos? Is there a motion to adopt the uh, award uh, for the police station renovation to Victory Building Team? Thank you. Okay, there's a, there's a motion by Ms. Hutchison and a second by Dr. Adami, and Dr. Turner has a question. No. I'm I, sorry, Mr. Kelly has I'm a question. $2.4 million to renovate, is there, um, maybe I'm forgetting, is there specific issues with making it a police station that makes it so expensive to renovate? Um, well, there are very specific criteria required uh, as dictated by the state to have our own police department. So, and it is about, about having that. We had the police department and the, Tammy was directly involved in what's going into this so that we are in compliance with the state requirements. So the answer is yes? Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And this is not a current police station? No, it, it was the old bookstore at the corner of Ayers. Okay. So. Okay. Sorry, there, there might be some confusion right. as to what, what we're talking about here yes. or, or where we're talking about it. Yes, exactly. There you go. Any other questions for Mr. Strabos? All those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. Any opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Strabos. Um, Mr. Garcia is going to talk to us about the Interlocal Purchasing Cooperative Membership. Thank you, Madam Chair. So the college is recommending a membership to the University of Texas System Supply Chain Alliance, administered by the University of Texas System. It is a coalition of 15 Texas universities and other affiliated institutions that acts as a group purchasing organization to leverage their spending uh, purchasing power and maximize while maximizing cost savings uh, for its members. There is no cost uh, for becoming a member. The cooperative will allow the college to have access to multiple vendor and product lines uh, to meet the future needs of the Osho Creek campus. This proposed action item is in accordance with the requirements of the Texas Education Code 44.0331. The college is uh, asking for your an action on this item, please. Yeah. Thank you, sirs. Uh, any questions for Mr. Garcia? I've got one. Yes, sir. Okay. I understand this is off base. We're talking about um, buying things, but this, and I know that we've cultivated a relationship with the A&M system with the two local universities, um, the, but does this help build a relationship with the UT system where maybe we can start um, streamlining our classes to be accepted at UT campuses? Short answer is I don't think so. Uh, I was just wondering. But it's a bit of a stretch, two different topics. Yeah, hey, this is a business process and I'm, I'm the one who asked Roll to do the heavy, heavy lifting for me that uh, if you know about cooperative purchase agreements, they are negotiated and it's a way to buy, well, your dais that you're sitting at, for example. No, um, I'm, I'm familiar with them, right. yes. And so this is another, uh, and part of what happens is the UT system was using, for example, the buy board, and then mm -hmm. they woke up one day and said, why are we using some other co-op when we can start our own co-op? And that's basically what they've done. Okay. Right, yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with buy board as well. Um, I know it was. I know it was a stretch. Just wondering. 
Is there a motion to uh, authorize staff to uh, enter into interlocal purchasing cooperative membership with the UTSSCA? Thank you, Mr. Kelly, second by Mr. Garza. I can call you Dr. <laughs> Kelly. Sure, why not? Thank you. Any other questions on that motion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Garcia. All right, the last item on the agenda is related to the uh, San Patricio County Appraisal District Board of Directors. Mr. Ger Mr. Rivera. Thank you, Regent Scott. Regents, you have in front of you um, a memo that explains what's going on here as a taxing entity in San Patricio County. The college is entitled to participate with the other taxing entities in the election of directors to the five-member board of directors for the appraisal district. Uh, they've got kind of an involved voting process where the number of votes that are allocated to each taxing entity is directly based on how much, how many, how much is levied in taxes in 2020. Uh, you see from the long list of entities that Del Mar College is not very high. I guess that should be a positive for you. Uh, but you see that you have a total of, well, according to this, it says 17 votes. So there's a correction. We, in a, Robert Sensi, the chief appraiser, has, um, has advised us that they made a miscalculation in the number of votes you get. They assume that you had the same tax rate as the city of Corpus Christi, and you don't. It's lower. So you don't have 17 votes. Um, you have seven. So <laughs> seven votes, and you can spread those out any way you can. You're going to vote for five candidates at some point when we the ballot is prepared. And we are not voting today. Today no. is if, if we would like to make a nomination, right. one mm -hmm. up to five nominations to the right. San Patricio County Appraisal District. That action would need to take place today. We won't act technically vote until uh, End of October. The Decem December. Uh, December. You get the ballot at the end of October. So that, that's the other part. You are entitled to nominate up to five candidates if you wish. I went ahead and included again for, you know, it's in the letter, but the, the, the folks that are already sitting on the appraisal board so mm -hmm. you could see that. So I leave it up to you. Any, any possible action? This is merely a discussion action and I, discussion item and action if you, so, if you so choose to nominate someone. Right. Yeah, I don't have any interest in nominating anybody. Thank you. The kind of number we have, the only time that we're actually going to be, I'm going to say a participant is probably there's a contested uh, right. election of some sort and somebody comes knocking mm -hmm. on our door asking us for their, for their support. So, for yeah, our, our seven votes. Our, yeah, yeah, our, you know, bonanza Talk, seven but, votes, right? But Talk to Senator Joe Manchin in West Virginia yeah. where there may be right. sometimes. <laughs> You never know. <laughs> I just thought that it would be a good idea to put it on the sure. agenda just so we could Absolutely. see Absolutely. Time, Timing-wise, yeah. if, right. if you'd wanted to take action, you'd have to do it today because they have to have the names in. But if you don't, that's fine, too. But at, huh. at some point, with all the activity in San Patricio, sure. the number of votes that we get could increase, and, good point. and the number of dollars that we actually get from San Patricio could be significant. So. And both of these yeah, uh, appointments should be on our annual calendar, Delia, uh, biennially, so we, we know to kind of pay attention to it and be anti anticipate when it comes up. Right. So, All right, if there's no okay. action then on this item, we will uh, move on to, to uh, closed session. Uh, if you'll allow me to read the language real quick, the, we're going to go into closed session under Texas Government Code 551.071 regarding the pending or contemplated litigation or settlement offer with possible discussion and action in open session and the seeking of legal advice from counsel on pending and legal or contemplated matters or claims with possible act discussion and action in open session and under Texas Government Code 551.074 regarding the appointment, employment, evaluation, reassignment, duties, discipline, or dismissal of a public officer employee, including the board's self-evaluation, and B, status of the CIO position with possible discussion and action in open session. The time is 3.54 p.m. Are we going to stay in here, or are we going to go into the closed session room? We're going to go into the closed session room. Okay. The board has come out of closed session at 4.29 p.m. There is no action uh, coming out of closed session. Uh, members, uh, 
Ms. Pettis uh, emailed us the calendar in advance of the board meeting. Uh, our next meeting of the board will be on November 10th. And then uh, that week we will also have our board retreat at the end of that week, starting with a board dinner that Wednesday night, all day Thursday, and we anticipate Friday morning is uh, what our anticipated schedule is right now. Any questions about our upcoming calendared events? If not, then we are adjourned at 4.30 p.m. Thank you all very much.